All right, all right, all right. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone to the Eight Arnold's HSE Physics Revision 2022 lecture. I hope you have been having a great week so far and you are ready to jump into some lovely physics. Your brain is in too fried from all that study that you guys have been doing. Um, I hope you are keen to jump into some. Thank you for joining me today on this. Uh, look, the weather today, at least where I'm at, seems to be fluctuating quite substantially. I was going to say it's a beautiful day. But then I looked outside and just all clouds. So, I mean, hey, I guess there's nothing better to be, to be doing in the rain than in some rainy weather than uh, being inside and doing some physics. Um, just before we jump into the lecture, though, a couple of things off the bat. Number one, this whole lecture is being recorded. So if at any point during the lecture you're like, hey, Tim actually said some like decent points there. Let me go back and watch that again later. Don't worry. Pretty much as soon as the live stream is over, you'll be able to access a recording of the entire thing. Basically, just wherever you're watching it right now, it will be available there. Number two, if you are, want to access the slides that I'm using for my lecture today, um, if you scroll down a little bit, you should be able to find a resources section to the side of the screen. I don't want to point because I don't know which direction it's going to be. I think maybe it's that side. Um, you scroll down there, down the bottom of that should be download the slides, have a little thing to like access the slides for that. So you can get all of the slides that I am using here. And number three, while you are down there, you should be able to find a little box um, that basically has two tabs in it. One of those tabs is a Q&A box. So if at any point throughout the lecture, you have any questions about anything, um, chuck them in the Q&A and I will have, uh, I will answer them later on in the lecture. And also um, throughout the lecture, because this is a review, lecture we are going to be doing a ton of practice questions together and so I'm going to be asking you to answer all of the questions alongside with me so you can fill that out in the poll section now we've currently got the pre-lecture poll going on right now in the poll section so if you haven't already filled that out go ahead check it out fill it in it's a good little time just to get us ready and pumped for the rest of the lecture Speaking of which, let's jump into it. So before we jump into the actual content, um, welcome if you've never been to an ATAR Notes lecture before. We are ATAR Notes, we're a group of past students, for students, um, we basically all know how absolutely horrific the HSE can be at times, and so we wanna help you guys to do the absolute best that you possibly can. You guys are almost there, you've almost made it to the end, just a couple more weeks and then you will be done, and you will be like us, you will be past students. You can come and join the ranks, which is very exciting. Um, and on our website, we have a bunch of free resources. We've got study notes, we've obviously got these lectures, um, and even though you've managed to make your way to the physics lecture, we've got tons of lectures for all your other subjects, right? So you, some of you may have been at the chemistry lecture in the morning and going to the maths lecture in the afternoon, but we've got uh, lectures for all of your different subjects, um, whether it be English, whether it be other sciences, whether it be all of your maths, whether it be history, whatever you need, um, we probably have a lecture for it. Can't guarantee it, but most of them we have covered. We've also got an incredible forum that you can access and get help from past students like me. We've got a newsletter, we've got videos, and we've got a wonderful ATAR, uh, ATAR calculator if you want to see how you are going. And you can check all of that out on our brand new website. Go over to atarnotes.com. It's very schmick, very cool, lovely. I mean, you probably are like on it, uh, some variation of it right now, and you can probably see it's, it's kind of sick. Um, on top of that, we also have a couple of paid resources as well. We've got an incredible tutoring program. We've got lots and lots of private tutoring. Um, we've got study guides to help you out, and we've got my personal favorite, the wonderful and unlimited, but I will have a chat about all of that stuff later on in the lecture. Before we jump into the lecture, though, you might be wondering, well, who am I? Who is this guy who's chatting at you? Hello. Very nice to meet you. My name is Tim. I graduated from my HSE in 2020. I did it for University of Maths, Physics, Chemistry, and advanced English. Um, I got an ATAR of 99.75 and I'm currently studying maths and quantum engineering at UNSW, which is a lot of fun. And hey, if you have any questions, because I know a lot of people who do physics are interested in sort of the STEM engineering fields. Um, if you're interested in any of that sort of stuff, chuck a question in the Q&A. I would love to chat about that stuff. Um, in my free time, I really like Minecraft. Um, I play a lot of Minecraft. Uh, you can see some of my, I, I like to build like massive things on survival. Um, and I guess like if 
if studying maths wasn't masochistic enough, um, I also really enjoy endurance running. So this is me uh, wrapping up the Sydney Marathon last week. Um, even though I might be smiling, I am dying inside. <laughs> that was so painful. But it was a good time. Let's just jump into the lecture. So the plan for today. This is the last stretch. Like, we literally have only a handful of days left to go until your final exam is here. So today we are focusing on filling in any gaps in the essential knowledge and trying to just sort of practice different question types for the actual exam. Now, because of that, um, I sort of want to do, like, tailor it slightly to, to what you guys need, so I'm going to prioritize Q&A time over getting through everything in the slides. Now, I imagine because it is so towards the end, it's probably not, we like, I haven't checked how many people are here yet, um, but there's, I would imagine that there's probably not tons of you, so, um, chuck as many Q&A questions in as you like, and I will probably be able, I, I don't want to promise anything, but I probably will be able to get through all of them, because I'm going to prioritize actually answering the Q&A questions, so do, um, actually chuck your questions in the chat, but vaguely, here's what the plan is, we're going to go through, basically, just really quickly wrap through, like, everything that we, that is in the syllabus, um, and then we're going to focus on some of the harder concepts, so stuff like uh, different, like basically just weird things that people will often ask questions about. Um, and then we'll focus on calculation questions. We'll st do a whole bunch of uh, tricky calculation questions, um, focusing on sort of like how do you understand the concepts. We'll have a bit of a break um, and then we'll do some more calculation questions and hopefully spend about half an hour or so at the end focusing in on long response questions and how you can answer your extended response questions because I know a lot of people are not huge fans of those there. Um, and of course, throughout the lecture, we will have a ton of Q&A. We'll have a break in between the two blocks as well and I'll try and answer a whole bunch of questions before that and then a whole bunch of questions at the end as well. Um, at the end of block, I'm going to have Q&A there. And just on that note of Q&A, so if you haven't already, if you came slightly late to the lecture, let me just quickly recap the things I said off the top. Number one, this whole thing is being recorded, so you'll be able to access the, the recording at the end of the live stream. You can download the slides in the resources section on one of the slides. Um, and also, if you flick down, you should be able to find two uh, little interaction boxes down below. The first of them is a poll section. We've currently got the pre-lecture poll going on down below. And whenever we're doing a question together, you should be able to to access the question down below. Um, and also, throughout the, the lecture, you can ask questions about everything and anything, whether it be content, whether it be uh, exam strategy, study strategy, um, just general uni life and stuff like that. Whatever you'd like, I, I would be more than happy to answer, um, and we will have a great time. But in the meantime, I hope a couple of you have filled in the pre-lecture poll. Let's see what is going on there. So, how are we going? Okay, look, <laughs> it's good to see that we've got a decent number of people who are feeling okay, but also it is thoroughly understandable that the majority of you are in this state here, right? You're probably in the last few weeks, or you are in the couple of weeks leading up to your English exams, it may feel like everything is just suddenly here and it's so real and like you weren't expecting it to be this sudden. But it's okay, I promise you, you will get through it. It's only a couple of weeks, and when you're on the other side, no, like, it feels incredible to be done with. I promise you, you will make it through. You're almost there. It's the last stretch, okay, the last couple of weeks, and then you never have to sit the HSC ever again, and it's absolutely incredible. How are trials? All right, a, a couple of people are not having a good time. Most people, though, we're feeling decently okay with them, um, which is wonderful to see. Um, favorite module, a lot of people vibing with module six, but that's a better split than I thought it would be. Um, I hope you appreciated some of the, the descriptions I came up with because I thought, I thought I was being pretty big brain by it, by coming up with some of these. Um, but lovely, the even split between module five and eight is very interesting, but we've got some, some module six fans and not so many people. We don't like waves. Nobody likes light. We, we are just, uh, we like the darkness. We embrace the darkness, reject the light. Nobody likes module seven. Imagine likening, like, imagine liking module seven, guys. It could not be me. Um, okay, but then the most important question of all, which pizza topping are you? Um, we've got a lot of cheesy fans. That's a, a good time. Um, a couple of sauce fans. We got the, the sauce. Imagine liking, imagine being the pineapple, like, come on, <laughs> imagine, and then we've got one tomato fan in the crowd, uh, to the single tomato homie, I respect you, 
Oh, no tomatoes. Sorry, I could, it had been covered. Nobody likes the tomatoes. Um, it's just the battle of the cheese versus the sauce with like two pieces of pineapple and one piece. I guess it's like one piece of bacon. The, the solo bacon fan out there, big up. Um, and we've just got another pineapple fan. Maybe I've spent too much time on this question, but this is the real, the real important stuff that I just wanted to make sure we had a good crowd, a couple of people feeling saucy, a couple of people feeling cheesy. And see, the reason pineapple's bad is because you can't do the same thing. Like, a couple of people feeling pineapple-y, like, that doesn't even make sense, okay? Like, literally what? Okay, lovely. Welcome to the welcome to the lecture. <laughs> With that out of the way, let's actually jump into some of the content. So, a couple of things. Your exam will be on Thursday, the third of November. Um, now that date, thirty-seven days away, may not necessarily be correct. Um, that was based off when what I thought it was when I wrote the slides. Maybe a couple more days or a couple less days. Might be thirty-five. Might be, yeah, it might be thirty-five instead of thirty-seven. Um, don't a hundred percent quote me on that. Actually, no, 37 seems right, because Thursday's in two. Anyway, um, your exam is on the 3rd of November. You get five minutes of reading time and three hours of working time. Um, you ha will have 20 multiple choice questions and uh, 80 marks in your ex uh, of short answer questions. So that's roughly about 1.8 minutes per mark. Now, realistically, you're not going to spend 1.8 minutes per mark on every single question, right? Like, some of the multiple choice questions are just going to be like, yo, uh what does a motor look like? Or like, hello, uh, what did Newton do? And those questions will take you all of like 10 seconds. And then the last multiple choice question is going to be like, Jimmy dropped an apple, calculate the mass of the sun. And that'll take you like six minutes to, to do. So um, in general, we want to vaguely allocate around about one minute per mark in the multiple choice. And that then means we can save some time to then spend later on in our short answer responses, um, and then hopefully have some time at the end to go back through and check some of your answers again. Just quickly on the note of checking, um, if you are someone who often finds yourself with a lot of time to go back and check, and who doesn't necessarily feel like you want to always go back and check, my uh, recommendations for when you are checking is to go through very strategically. So always check the first couple of multiple choice questions, just because, or like, I'm assuming that you start off with the multiple choice section, but if uh, you, when you're like starting an exam, your brain is usually still warming up. And so if you're going to make mistakes, most of this, like the highest chance for you to make a stupid mistake is at the start when you're like really just like, ah, oh, I'm in the HSC exam. Oh, what am I going to do? Um, and so your brain just is like, oh yes. One plus one, that's seven. Hell yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just go back and check those things because you'll find that you, you probably made some dumb things. The other thing to do is just plug all of your calculations back into your calculator so that you will find the one place where you accidentally clicked the wrong button at some point and botched a calculation. That's just some side note for like making sure you can make the most use out of your checking. Um, however, just in general, as far as like using marks, Part of the, the skill of taking an exam is making sure that there will be easy questions and making sure that you don't spend very much time on the easy questions and instead using the easy questions as a springboard to build up time so that then when you get to the harder questions, you have enough time to actually do them in sufficient detail. Um, Okay, so that's what your exam is. Let's take a look at what's actually going to be inside it. So all the way back at mo in module five, advanced mechanics, we looked at making stuff move, right? We've got projectile motion, we've got uh, centripetal motion, we've got motion in a gravitational field. Then in module six, we looked at electromagnetism, right? Which was basically just making stuff move even more, right? So electric fields cause parabolic or projectile motion, magnetic fields cause circular motion. Um, we have like for forces on current carrying conductors and forces on single particles. We combine those in funky ways and that allows us to actually use things like motors and generators and transformers and uh, electromagnetic braking and do a whole bunch of cool things like that. Then we looked at the nature of light and that's where stuff started to get real wild. So Maxwell told us that a light is just an electromagnetic wave um, and then we proved that it was a wave by uh, doing diffraction and interference in the double slit experiment. But then we did the photoelectric effect and we're like, hmm, what if it's actually a particle? And then Einstein was like, actually forget if it's a wave or a particle. Guys, space and time are relative. Nothing is real. Everything is, is a lie. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was basically what happened in module seven. And then finally in module eight, 
we got a little bit of a buffet, a little bit of a taste test of everything that is just going on in modern physics, right? So we looked at uh, the Big Bang Theory, we looked at sort of the weird stuff that happens at a very, very small scale, we took a cheeky look at quantum mechanics, we took a, le a cheeky look at how, like, we actually know the stuff that we know, and we wrapped it up with some of the, the stuff from the standard model. All right, so what was the point? Right? Like, we've done all of that sort of stuff. You learned all your HSE physics. What was the point? Now, this is sort of personal conjecture, but I think the HSC syllabus, physics syllabus, is a really great launching point for understanding those, those mysterious laws that have created the universe that we live in, right? Um, you hopefully have gained, I mean, you may not be feeling this at this particular point, but hopefully by this point, like, by this point, you will have gained a degree of appreciation for just how the world works, right? Because you've been able to understand and explore some of the underlying laws and mechanics that govern the way that the universe works. And that's why physics is so cool, is because it's learning about those laws that govern the way that, like, the world operates, which is, is really, really exciting. Um, so hopefully, even while not necessarily now, at some point you can look back and you can say, yes, no, I do actually appreciate some of the stuff that I learned here is really freaking cool. However, as far as practical skills, hopefully you've also gained the ability to sort of analyze experiments and look at how theories evolve and adapt over time and have to respond to new evidence. You've, un you've gained an appreciation of how you can apply theory to actual practical circumstances and how you can use mathematics to sort of describe what might be going in on in a theoretical or a practical circumstance. And maybe just maybe at the end of uh module a you got a bit excited about like the fact that there is still stuff out there that we don't know that like is still left out there to to be discovered and as a uh, as like graduating year 12s you're at that point where you get to choose what are you going to do with the rest of your life and there are so many different opportunities that where like you can be part of this the the answer to that question of what else is there left to understand and what else is there to learn in the universe with that being said let's actually jump into some content let's that now that we've we've looked at where we've come from Let's focus on the last little bit, with the last stretch. Let's grind out some physics, let's grind out some of the hard stuff, and let's get working on some of our content. So first of all, just a quick revision of all of our units, right? Nano, you're hopefully comfortable with that after doing like the nature of light, times 10 to the negative nine, micro times 10 to the negative six, couple of other ones, your mega times 10 to the six, your giga times 10 to the nine. Next thing, your right hand, uh, which right hand rule are you going to use? Now, there are two different kinds of right hand rules um, that we use in different situations. I like to call them the right hand grip rule and the right hand slap rule. Your right hand grip rule is the one where you curl your fingers. The right hand slap rule is the one where you have your flat, your fingers flat. Now, technically, they are basically the same thing. However, I would say there are some situations where it's easier, much, much easier to apply a particular one rule over the other. So let's start out with the right hand grip rule. The right hand grip rule basically shows you the relationship between a current in a carrying uh, in a conductor and a magnetic field or vice versa. Now the really great thing about the right hand grip rule is it's kind of reversible, right? Your thumb can represent current, your fingers can represent the magnetic field or vice versa. Like there's no necessarily, not necessarily one direction that you have to go in. Um, now the right hand grip rule is really, really great for anything that involves a circle, anything that involves a closed loop or any kind of relationship between currents or magnetic fields. Um, you could even hypothetically use it uh, to figure out the direction of a force that's traveling between two uh, parallel wires. So um, the way that we actually use it, if you're looking at a magnetic field, you can curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field and your thumb will point in the direction of the current that would produce that magnetic field. Um, or conversely, if you have a direction of a current and you can curl your fingers in the direction of that current, your thumb will point from the south pole to the north pole of your magnetic field. It will basically travel in the direction of the magnetic field that we are interested in. Um, so let's have a go at trying to figure out this question here. So current flows um, anti-clockwise in a circular loop. What will the direction of the induced magnetic field be? Well, in order to answer this question, we have to consider what is going on in this situation. Um, you can curl your fingers around in a circle um, to figure out, like, to point them in the direction of um, the, the current that is flowing in the circle. So if you curl your fingers, uh, 
curl your fingers around it to point anti-clockwise. Your thumb is pointing out of the page there. Um, now, the weird thing that you kind of have to remember is that your thumb, in this case, is pointing from the South Pole to the North Pole. Now, normally we think about the uh, the magnetic field as moving from the North Pole to the South Pole. So, um, if our thumb is pointing towards us, that's kind of like saying that uh, the the magnetic field is moving from the South Pole to the North Pole towards us. But because we normally think of a magnetic field as going from North to South, it's actually in the opposite direction, right? So your magnetic field is actually moving, your thumb is pointing towards you, so it's sort of like, it's telling you that the North Pole is your direction, which means that the, if it's producing um, the magnetic field, it must be moving into the page. And so because of that, we can say that the magnetic field is moving into the page here. Um, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to everyone there. Okay, um, lovely, sorry. Let's take a look at this next question here. So another quick right hand grip rule here. So this is the right hand grip rule for using solenoids or for, for figuring out stuff that's going on with eddy currents here. So um, this is sort of what I mean where your current is, uh, when you're curling your fingers to look for the current, your thumb points in the direction of the north uh, side of the magnetic field, right? We can kind of consider what was going on here as like one ring of our solenoid, right? So our magnetic field in this case is moving uh your thumb points to the north side of the magnetic field and then the rest of your fingers curl around in the direction of the current and this is really useful for figuring out stuff like eddy currents and for figuring out stuff like solenoids it basically allows you to think okay where's the magnetic field moving and so as a result where is my current going to move um subsequently as a result after that so that's kind of where we can use this right hand grip rule is whenever we're dealing with stuff like uh like circular circuits or a uh, current that's flowing from north to south or stuff like that basically whenever we sorry uh whenever we've got a, mag a magnetic field that's moving through some kind of solenoid that's where we can use this right hand rule there our last kind of right hand rule is our right hand slap rule so just to sort of summarize right our first right hand grip rule is for stuff like currents in circuits um or if we've got a magnetic field that's circular we can figure out where the direction of the magnetic field that's moving around that current carrying conductor is going to be um our second right hand rule is great for solenoids and stuff like circular circular wires um our third right hand rule is for forces so that's kind of the key thing that i want to get across with this one is this right hand rule here is really super useful for whenever uh, we're dealing with forces here. So your thumb is going to, um, and this is for forces both on a single charged particle um, or forces on a current carrying conductor as well. So you can figure out what direction the force is going to be um, on a charged particle that has a positive charge or like a conventional current. So if we're doing a charged particle, your thumb is going to point in the direction of the motion of a positive particle. Your uh, the rest of your fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field, and then the force, you can think of it as like coming out the front of your palm. Um, conversely, if you're dealing with a negative particle, you're going to use your right hand rule instead, and then if we're looking at a current carrying conductor, your thumb will point in the direction of conventional current, because we usually think of conventional current as flowing from positive to negative, rather than the other way around. Okay, let's use all of that to have a go at this question here. So let's uh, have a cheeky go at this uh, practice question here. So an experiment is set up as shown. Um, when the switch is closed, the reading on the spring balance changes immediately and then returns to the initial reading. Which row of the table correctly shows the direction of the current through the straight conductor XY and the direction on in which the pointer on the spring balance initially moves? Now, just as a bit of context, um, a spring balance, if you're not com fully like comfortable with dealing with these, um, basically it's just a way of measuring the mass that it's measuring. So it's sort of like, imagine if you were to pull the spring balance down, the pointer would move down with it. Whereas if you were to push the spring balance back up, the pointer would move up with it as well. Okay. Um, so when the switch is closed, this reading on the spring balance changes immediately, then uh, returns to the initial reading. Which row of the table correctly shows the direction of the current through the straight conductor XY and the direction in which the pointer on the spring balance initially moves? It's 
So if our switch closes, we've got a complete circuit around this lower electromagnet down there. And sorry, did I switch? So yes, you can, you can answer the question. If you feel confident, this is a fairly, fairly tricky question. So if you just want to work a lot, if you want to, and sorry, side note on like just questions, because I did kind of breeze through that. I'm sorry. Um, if whenever you see a star on a question, you should be able to answer it in the Slido poll down below. Um, if you feel confident answering it by yourself, go ahead and chuck your answer down whenever you're ready. Um, if you're kind of like, I'm unsure, you feel free to work along with it with me. Um, whereas if you're sort of like, I have no idea how to do this question, feel free to do the whole thing with me. I'm sorry, but if you feel like decently confident in doing it by yourself, feel free to uh, do sort of part of it with me. But then if you get to a point where you're like, oh, nah, I understand this question. Now this question's easy. You can go ahead and do the rest of the question entirely by yourself. Okay, that being said, let's jump into it. So the switch closes, that means we've now got a complete circuit and so current is going to flow. Now this is, uh, if you remember back to like your year 11 batteries and stuff, a battery has the longer side being positive and the shorter side being negative, which means we're going to get current that flows around from positive to negative. So it's gonna flow through your current carrying conductor like that. Now, hopefully you recognize that this is a solenoid looking thing. So the way we can figure out the direction of the magnetic field through this solenoid is using our right hand grip rule, right? So curl your fingers in the direction of the current as though you're sort of grabbing a solenoid like that. And your, thing, your thumb should be pointing downwards, right? Your thumb points downwards towards the North Pole, which means we're going to have a North Pole generated on this side of the magnetic field and a South Pole generated on this side of the magnetic field, right? Now, magnetic fields go north to south, which means I suppose if you're interested in where the magnetic field going is going, it's going to go through the solenoid from north to south like that. Um, well, actually, wait, hang on. Ignore that. Sorry. Um, it's going to flow around the solenoid like that from north to south. Inside the solenoid, it should go from south to north. I'm very sorry about that. Okay. Um, I may have watched that on the previous question. I'm very sorry if I brushed through that. Um, okay. So with that being said, um, we figured out that we've got a north to south pole uh, generated like that. Now we need to consider how is that going to affect the uh, previous, how is that going to affect the so, uh, spring balance up above? So how is that going to affect the electromagnet that we've got hanging above there? Now, in order to do that, we need to turn to our lovely, lovely uh, friend, Lenz's Law, who's going to tell us uh, what is sort of going on, what's going to happen as a result of the magnetic field that is generated here. Um, okay, so in order to generate this magnetic field here, um, we will have to, sorry, so we've got some North Pole that's being generated here. Um, and so Lenz's law states that the uh, current in the top electromagnet is gonna be generated so as, so as to oppose whatever change is being like caused on it to there. Now, because we've sort of gone from a state of having no magnetic flux to a point of having some magnetic flux, because we've sort of gone from having no magnetic field to having a south pole there, Lenz's law says, okay, we want to oppose that change. If we're increasing the amount of magnetic flux we've got, we want to oppose that by decreasing it. And the way we can decrease it is by trying to generate a magnetic field that is moving in the opposite direction, right? And the way we can do that is by just, in, if we've got a south pole down here, we sort of want to, to generate one that's going in the opposite direction so we can generate another south pole here and a north pole up there. So just TLDR is again, what's going on here. We used our right hand grip rule to figure out what direction um, our magnetic field will be moving through this solenoid. And then that allowed us to figure out um, what was happening that, that allowed us to figure out that we had a south pole up the top here. And because Lenz's law says we want to oppose whatever change is going on, um, we will then have to generate another south pole up the top over here. So we can use our right hand grip rule to figure out what is going on, um, what kind of current we're going to generate in this top conductor up here. And if we do that, our fingers will curl around like that. Um, and if you follow the current around, you can see it's going to flow from this point X down to this point Y here. So based off that, we can get rid of options C or D. And so now we just have to consider what is going to go on like as between these two south poles here. Well, because you've got two south poles of a magnet next to each other, um, 
we can say those two south poles are next to each other, they're not going to be very, like, chill next to each other. They're not going to be having a very good time next to each other. And so as a result, they are going to repel each other. So when we turn on this switch, the, like, hanging mass is going to be repelled from the solid mass down the bottom. And so it's going to jump up a little bit, like it's going to bounce up a little bit, and the pointer will follow that to say that it's going to jump up a little bit as well. And so as a result, our answer is going to be B. Now, let me just quickly check that. That has made me realize that, in fact, that question we did two questions ago, I absolutely completely botched it. I don't know why I did it. I was, see, this is what I meant about, right? Make sure that you always check your first question, right? Because that's when your brain is still getting warmed up to the physics grind, all right? I said it was going into the page. You use your right-hand rule. It's pointing out of the page. I don't know why I said that. Um, Yeah, it's, it's coming out of the page. I'm very sorry for getting that wrong. Please forgive me. It's like I said, my brain, that's why I, I, I always have to make sure that I go back and check the first question again. Um, but that one is actually coming out of the page. In this case here, um, we're going to have that situation that we have set up as shown. And it is lovely to see that most of you guys have gotten that correct answer. Be. Um, lovely. Okay, let's keep moving. Let's take a look at the next idea of motors and generators. Now, we've just talked a little bit about Lenz's law and trying to figure out which change opposes, like, the initial change that we have going on here. Um, now, Lenz's law is, states that the direction of the induced EMF and the resulting current creates a magnetic field that opposes the original change in flux through the circuit. Now, in general, if we are doing questions specifically on Lenz's law, I like to break down my process into two steps. First of all, like what is the actual change um, in flux that's going on here, right? In the previous question, the change in flux that we encountered was we had this magnetic field that was generating downwards, right? We had an increasing magnetic field being generated downwards. Now, once we have identified what the change in flux is, we can actually figure out, like, what does it look like to oppose the initial change in flux? And that's where we got this south pole from, from basically saying, okay, we wanted to oppose this change in flux. And so as a result, um, we needed to have another south pole. We basically needed to have a magnetic field that was moving in the opposite direction to try and cancel each other out. So that's just how we can use Lenz's law to do uh, any, any kind of Lenz's law question. That's the general technique we can use um, to figure out like what's actually going to go on as a result. Now, a quick note on the difference between a motor and a generator. You might be slightly rusty on this. A motor, um, you pass an electric current through your circuit, right? You've got some kind of battery down here. It passes an electric, uh, an electric current through your circuit. It's got a uh, permanent magnet uh, that's passing that your current is going to pass through. As a result, your wire will experience some kind of force and that's going to make it spin. On the flip side, your generator, you have some kind of axle or some kind of like crankshaft that you're able to turn. So you are physically turning the motor, um, you're physically turning the coil inside the magnetic field. And because we know that if you move a coil inside a magnetic field, that is going to generate an EMF. And as a result, we get some kind of current that can pass through our circuit there. Um, I like to think of it in terms of the change in energy, right? A motor changes electrical energy into mechanical energy, whereas a generator turns mechanical energy into electrical energy there. Um, just one last quick note on generators. The way that generators would generate uh, an EMF is because your motion of the, the sorry the motion of the conductor in the magnetic field generates a back EMF, and that exact same back EMF shows up in a motor as well. It's what we call back EMF, and so that back EMF, as your motor gets faster and faster, increases to oppose the supply current, and that's what ultimately places some kind of limit on how fast your motor is able to travel. Um, so that's why, like, if you have a particular current moving through your motor, you can't have, like, an infinite speed of motor, because as your motor moves faster and faster and faster, it generates an opposing EMF that's going in the other direction, and that's what limits how fast your motor is able to travel. Okay, um, one last note on motors and generators. Your motor, you have a slip ring uh, generated, so the, the last, um, last picture here was for DC. Um, these are your AC motors. Now, AC motors say, work the same way, it's just the difference is that your slip ring, you have slip rings instead of split rings, um, so that you can always have one side of the circuit connected to the same side, because your AC current switches direction as it does, like, as, like, it would automatically. 
Um, okay, talking of EMF, let's quickly see what's going on in EMF. Now, these are some graphs just to sort of show you what's actually going on with uh, the EMF that's passing through the coil. Um, in our uh, Inside the coil, we've got an EMF that looks vaguely like this. Um, sorry, that looks exactly like this, right? Initially, we can imagine that you have a... Uh, Initially, we might have a large amount of magnetic field that is passing through our coil, and then as the coil rotates, it goes flat so that there's no, not as much uh, flux passing through the coil. Now, the formula for EMF is slightly funky. Your formula is negative delta... Uh, delta phi over delta t. Now, because most of you, I would imagine, do advanced maths, um, you're probably fairly comfortable with some degree of calculus. So, just as a quick side note, the formal definition for EMF is actually in terms of a derivative. So, I actually prefer to think of this formula just as, like, the derivative of flux as opposed to, like, change in flux. So, if our flux graph, in this case, I might draw a quick flux graph of what's going on next to our EMF graph. Initially, we have a whole lot of flux. We have a large amount of flux. Then as our coil shifts, um, it decreases. Our flux decreases down to this point here where we're completely flat and no magnetic field is passing through the coil. Um, then as our coil continues to rotate, our flux uh, might drop down to the other side. And then once again, at some point, we're going to uh, hit this point again where we have no magnetic field. Um, and then conversely, it just continues on like this. And basically, if we our flux looks like this, if this is a graph of our flux versus time, the induced EMF is the negative derivative of what this graph looks like. So initially, our gradient is zero. That's why we have a, uh, an induced EMF that initially looks like zero. But then over time, as our gradient starts, our flux starts to decrease, the EMF starts to increase because it's a negative, but it's the derivative, so it's following the gradient, um, and then that continues down to this point zero, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of the relationship between the flux, which is pictured up here, and the actual EMF that we see. However, the other key takeaway that I want you to get from this slide is even though this might be the EMF that is induced inside the coil of a generator, when we actually take this coil and we connect it to the external circuit, this is where it depends depends on whether or not we've got, a, whether we're generating an AC, uh, AC source or whether we've got a DC source, because the AC source will just give us what we've got directly, whereas the DC source is going to instead flip it every half turn, so it's always pointing in the same direction, which gives us an EMF that looks like that. Basically, those split rings are making sure that it's switching the side of the current cut, the coil, um, the external Sorry, I can't speak for a second. Just hold up. Um, basically, those split ring commutators, right, are switching the side of the external circuit that the coil is attached to. And so as a result, it's switching the direction of the current every half turn. Um, one last thing on stuff for motors and generators is looking at a, our torque. Now, the torque looks very similar um, to our coil here. Now, in this graph, in this formula that I've chucked up here, I've actually used the formula NIAB cos theta, just because um, the theta that's in your formula, and we'll actually take a look at this bit, a bit later on if we have time. The way the torque works in motors is very, very confusing, um, because you might have your magnetic field moving like this, and this is, say, here's like some axle of your... your uh, you might be the axle of your coil with like some current moving in this direction. So this is like the current moving into the page here, current moving out of the page like that. Um, because the theta that shows up in your torque formula is actually the angle between your force and the direction of your current. Um, so in this case here, your magnetic field, sorry, the magnetic field force is going to be pointing up on this side and down on the other side. Um, and so the angle that we're actually interested in here is the, the angle that would go in the normal uh, formula is this sine theta here. Um, I think that that's kind of dumb. I prefer to just think of the angle here between the magnetic field and your the axis of your coil. So if this is your, if this long line here is the axis of your coil, these lines are your magnetic field. If you instead decide to use the cos formula, um, basically this is the angle that we are interested in here instead. That's just to explain why I gave cos here. Um, a quick side note on just cos and sine in formulas, I much prefer to think, like, I would say in general, it's much more useful because there's so many formulas that have angles in them, and it can be kind of confusing to remember which angle each of our different formulas is referring to. Um, I would say it's, it's 
oftentimes a lot more useful to think about where we're going to get maximum, where we're going to get minimum um, of like whatever we're dealing with. So for example, in this case, we get a maximum force when our coil looks like this and our magnetic field looks like this because the force on your coil is perpendicular to the axis of your uh, of the rest of your coil um that's where we actually get our maximum magnitude um and so as a result you can see here the angle between our magnetic field and the angle and of our axis is zero and cos is cos of zero is a maximum um and so that's why i choose to use cos here instead of sine Okay, that tangent being aside, I'm sorry if that didn't make much sense to you because I just wanted to explain why that cause is there. Um, the torque on your coil reaches a maximum, as you can see. Uh, the, this is a graph sort of showing how the torque on your coil will work comparative to where your coil actually goes. Now, when I say normal magnets, I basically mean sort of your classic coil setup where you've got like a north pole on one side, south pole on the other side. Your coil is stuck around like that. Um, and so you've, you've got just like a constant direction of magnetic field. In this case here, your torque is, uh, starts off at zero if, you're, if you've got a position like this, basically because the forces are perpendicular to, sorry, the forces are going to be parallel to your, uh, your coil in this point. Um, whereas your torque reaches a maximum when your coil hits this point over here and so on and so forth. Um, it repeats like this. The other thing that I wanted to point out is this can change if you've got radial magnets. So this is the kind of thing that you would encounter in say an AC induction motor where basically you've got magnets the entire way around, right? Some kind of magnet that's the entire way around your magnetic field. So the magnetic field is constant in magnitude the full way around. Basically it's not changing wherever you are. Okay. That was a bit of a speed run of some of basically the hard stuff from your motors and generators. So we've taken a look at lenses a lot, we've taken a look at torque and EMF, all of the stuff that I know a lot of people don't have are not big fans of, and so I just wanted to speed run through some of that stuff. Um, I'm going to do that quickly with some of the stuff from Module 8 as well, because I know if you've come to some of the ATAR notes lectures beforehand, we actually didn't ever do one for Module 8, so I just wanted to speed run through some of the uh, yuck things from models of the atom. Now, a big part of our uh, Module 8 is looking at how the model of the atom has progressed over time, right? Um, and there's been quite a few different improvements. Now, we look in the HSC syllabus at a, I would say, about five different models of the atom in varying degrees of detail. And for each of these models, I would say you should be able to, first of all, identify what are the key iterations of the model of the atom. You should be able to then describe the experiments that were conducted to investigate those properties of the atom. Um, and then you should be able to explain how those experiments actually contributed to the development of the model, right? What were the outcomes of each of those experiments that like, led to very specific parts of the model of the atom, right? And then lastly, because each of our models of the atom is limited in their own way, right? They're called models for a reason because they can't quite exactly simulate reality. You need to be able to explain what were the limitations of each of the models. Um, so for example, with Bohr's model, right, the key features, they have electrons in quantized orbits. Each of those electrons has a particular energy. And in order to move between those energies, you either need to give them a photon, which will cause the, them to jump up an energy level, or if they jump down an energy level, they should release a photon with exactly the same amount of energy um, as like the, the change in energy had. Now, the experiments that sort of led to this, that's your stuff like uh, the emission and absorption spectra and being able to sort of uh, describe the, the changes between those. Um, and observing that those bands sort of occur at specific wavelengths, which indicate the quantizations of the energy. Um, however, Bohr's model, if it's known for one thing, it's known for the fact that it has a whole bunch of issues with it. Number one, Bohr didn't actually give a reason for why he did those quantized energy levels. He couldn't really explain why sometimes the absorption and emission spectrums that had given him sort of the inspiration and the evidence for the model um, did funky things. Like sometimes if you applied a really, really high magnetic field, they would split in two. And there were also these other ones called hyperfine field lines that like were really really skinny um and also like it only worked for the hydrogen atom and none of the other ones so that's i guess vaguely the kind of thing that you should be able to describe using Bohr's model um and if you can try and do that for most of your different models of the atom that is like setting you up very much for success. The other thing I would sort of say on top of this is I would really encourage you to understand how we can use each of the models. So for Bohr's model, the big thing that we can use is we've got the Rydberg equation, which is one on R, uh, one on NF squared minus one on N 
I squared, which basically just allowed us to calculate what are the which wavelengths of the emission spectrum of hydrogen correspond to which electron transitions inside of the atom itself. Um, and these limitations, sorry, are addressed in Schrodinger's model later. So just as a bit of a quick practice to check, have you guys uh, been paying attention? Have you like learn your models of the atom. Let's quickly just refresh our memories on this sort of stuff here. So let's construct a progressive list of models of the atom from the Greeks to the modern interpretation. Now I just want to check which ones, okay, I didn't actually start from the Greeks in my Slido model. Um, start off with the, bill I suppose, billiard ball model of the atom. Um, that was Dalton's model of the atom first. So I'm not actually quite sure how this Slido ball works because I've never done it before, but have a go at arranging uh, those models of the atom. Your top one should be which one one came first and your bottom one should be whichever one came last. All right. Um, now just as a quick side note, while you're all doing that, because I know a lot of people have questions, I tried to, to just address, I guess, kind of what you, I think you should know about uh, these models of the atom. Um, but vaguely the, the way, because a lot of people have questions about like, oh, how much should I memorize about these models of the atom? Because like, there's a lot of, and the, the potential for you to memorize a lot of stuff is really, really out there. Um, but in general, as far as like what I think you should really, really know, know vaguely like what was the context for the model? Like what were the experiments that actually led to it? So for example, for the plum pudding model, you should know Okay, actually, you know what, while you guys are doing this, let me just like, I'll try and give you a much more, like this is being recorded. I'll try and give you what I think, Tim, what Tim thinks um, you should know for each of the models of the atom. Okay, so plum pudding model, you should know about the cathode ray experiments, how they sort of led to that debate of like cathode ray, is it a particle or is it a wave? You should then know, um, what experiments did Thompson come up with to do the uh, oil drop, sorry, to figure out the mass to charge ratio. On that note, um, you should be able to do the same calculations that Thompson did are uh, to actually figure out what the mass to charge ratio is and explain how he did those calculations. Then you should be able to describe the plum pudding model, right? So the plum pudding model has a C of positive charge with those, uh, sorry, C of positive charge with those removable electron plums spread throughout it. Um, and the li big limitation with it, of course, is it doesn't really tell you what's going on with the positive charge. It just sort of skims over that. On that note as well, you should also know how Millikan conducted his experiment to actually figure out what the charge on the electron was. And then because they have the mass to charge ratio and the charge, they can use that to calculate the mass. Specifically with Millikan's oil drop experiment, it's really important to understand that idea of like, okay, uh, we used a whole bunch of unknown values and we found the lowest common denominator because we're assuming that this charge value is quantized. That was sort of the huge thing from his experiment. Now, going on from the plum pudding model, we have the nuclear model. So that was inspired by the oil like it came about because of the geiger marsden gold foil experiment, right? They shoot a whole bunch of alpha particles into a gold foil. Um, some of those gold foils, a lot of those, and this experiment, just as a quick side note, I really think it's a good idea to have like the nuclear model and the gold foil experiment kind of linked in your mind kind of permanently because they work together really, really closely. Um, so the gold foil experiment, you would express expect because you're shooting particles through a gold foil a lot of them like you would expect them to not pass through but first of all lots of them do pass through which tells you've got a whole bunch of empty space in your atom second thing some of them get deflected which means that we have uh, some kind of positive charge in our atom cool but um only some of them very very rarely get really really massively deflected which means we have some kind of positive charge but it's really really small and also really really dense um and so as a result that's where we get the idea of the nucleus from so the atom has a lot of empty space and a really, really dense positive nucleus. Um, a bit later, Chadwick comes along and does his experiments with beryllium and firing uh, radiation into beryllium. It knocks some of that stuff off because uh, they, can't measure the ch they can't measure a charge on it, so they say it probably doesn't have a charge. They think it's maybe gamma rays, but gamma rays don't have enough energy. And so he applies the law of conservation of momentum to say, okay, it probably has the around about the same mass as a proton, and thus the nuclear neutron is born. However, the big uh, limitation is that Rutherford can't explain what's going on going on with the electrons, right? The electrons are somewhere, but they can't be in the, the, the nucleus because the nucleus is positively charged. And so he just chucks them around the outside. Then comes along Bohr. Bohr's like, okay, let's actually just ignore the problem of the electrons and pretend they're in quantized orbits. It does all the stuff that I've already explained. However, the big problem is your positive uh, nucleus should attract your like negative electron in closer towards the atom. Um, 
and they don't. So why don't the electrons uh, collapse into the nucleus? Well, along comes de Broglie, or de Broglie. Um, and he's like, the reason that your electrons don't collapse into the nucleus is because they're not actually electrons, they're electron waves. So they're actually existing as standing waves around about your nucleus, and that's why they don't collapse into the nucleus, is because they're not particles. They're actually acting as waves in this standpoint here. Um, and all of those quantized wavelengths are actually, sorry, all of those quantized orbits are actually points where the electron wavelength can superimpose onto itself and form a standing wave. And then Schrodinger is like, cool story, bro. Let's just treat the entire thing as like, not just quantized wavelengths, but let's say the whole thing is just like a spooky, spooky wavelength mess. And he comes up with that idea of the cloud of probability. And that's pretty much where we are up to today. So lovely. We've got the billiard ball first. We've got the plum pudding second, Bohr's model third, the planetary model fourth, and Schrodinger's model down at the bottom there. Very, very nice work. That is makes me very happy to see. Okay, we spent quite a while there, so let's try and make a bit of a move on. So the last topic we are looking at, the last topic in module eight is looking at particle accelerators. Um, now, as to how much detail you need to know on particle accelerators, we don't really know, but I think it's a good idea to sort of know some specific examples that are interesting to you, right? The annoying thing with the last topic in Module 8 is it's so open-ended, it's just sort of like, explore the universe, which is very exciting, but it's sort of like, we're at the point where we just want to, we don't want to like, have to spend ages trying to research what we need to know. So I would say, you should know one example of a particle accelerator, kind of common examples are either the LHC um, in, i.e. the Large Hadron Collider in, uh, mental blank Europe. <laughs> um, or another great one you could do is the synchrotron in, down in Lucas Heights in Sydney. It's an, like, I guess our local particle accelerator. So it's an interesting resting one to know a little bit about. Um, of course, you could just know generally ideas about like cyclotrons and how those kinds of things work, um, drift accelerators, stuff like that. Generally just have an understanding of like what the purpose and the role of particle accelerators are in discovering particles. Specifically, I would say know how like your particular experiment has discovered something useful in physics. There was a question a couple of years ago in the HSC which asked to specifically describe the uh, discovery of two fundamental particles. Now, we are asked in the syllabus to look at one fundamental particle, the electron, but that second fundamental particle, well, that's up to you, right? So it was essentially, um, what I'm trying to say here is it's useful to actually know stuff that like you're interested in, but don't stress about knowing like absolutely everything about the particle accelerator. I'd say pick one, know it decently well, and you're probably good. That's probably all you really need to know. So just on the note of a cyclotron, right, this is our classic cyclotron. It's got two of these, um, and you've got your your accelerate your particle will accelerate between the gap between the two causes some kind of circular motion um and the voltage across the gap is continuously reversing backwards and forwards um that basically allows you to accelerate it and it gets really really fast as a result similarly you can have uh your drift accelerators your linear disc drift accelerators where your particle um goes through longer and longer drift tubes because it gets faster and faster and faster um okay discovering different particles the really interesting one i would say is the higgs boson um it's a tiny particle is found back in 2012. Um, we think it's kind of the reason we have mass, and if you're interested, you can look into that a whole lot further. Uh, particle physics is fascinating and also way too big brain for me. <laughs> um, it scares me. The Higgs boson then decays into two Z bosons, etc, etc. Looks like that. Um, it's all good times. Some other interesting particles you can look at the discovery of, stuff like quarks. So I think quarks were discovered in like the Stanford uh, Linear Accelerator. They basically shot a whole bunch of electrons into protons and were like, hmm, the proton is made up of like different densities at different points. Like maybe it's made up of three different things. Another really great one is the discovery of the muon, which was discovered in cloud chambers. They were basically like, okay, um, an electron makes like this kind of radius in a magnetic field, um, proton makes this kind of radius in a magnetic field, and then there's this other particle that does this like other radius in a magnetic field. Oh, it's the muon. Um, basically just know the discovery of at least one of these fundamental particles, just have a vague idea of how it was discovered. Um, lovely. The last thing, um, we can look at the actual standard model itself, right? So we've got four fundamental forces. We've got electromagnetism, which is carried by the photon. We've got the strong nuclear force, which is carried by the gluon. We've got uh, 
and then we've sorry yes yeah, so we've got the electromagnet i thought i thought i had them all on one page obviously i don't um so electromagnetism right is the force between any two things that have charge the strong nuclear force is the attraction between our two nucleons right so that's the thing that sort of holds the atom together and these two together give you all of the stuff the funky stuff that was going on with nuclear physics um then you've got gravity which is the thing that breaks the standard model right it's the attraction between any two things that have energy and finally you've got the weak nuclear force which is that force that we're all like, oh, yes, it is also a force, and we definitely understand how it works. <laughs> um, basically, and it's carried by by the W and Z bosons. Don't worry too much about it for the HSC, because believe me, I don't really understand how it works either. It's a it's a weird force. It's it's the odd child out. We don't ignore. We we kind of ignore it a lot of the time. Um, and these four fundamental forces work together to make up all of the other fundamental, all of the forces that we see in the universe. And finally, we have the standard model, which is all composed of all of the particles that make up our universe. We've got the quarks, we've got the leptons, the quarks, we've got our up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. And then the uh, leptons, you've got the muon, no, electron, muon, tau, and all of their corresponding um, things. Now, just on that quick note, um, Aside from the main standard model, i.e. the like 12 particles, the four bosons and the one scalar boson, um, I would say, sorry, and the one vector boson, I would say that that's really all you really need to stress to, like you don't have to know too much more about the standard model. Um, instead, the kind of thing that you might be asked about the standard model is this kind of question here. So um, just to sort of get a feel, I think I popped it up lovely. Um, someone's just really uh, um, very speed running on this question here. So the table lists the first generation of quarks and antiquarks. The standard model of matter states that baryons, such as protons and neutrons, consist of three quarks. So just as a side note there, that's the kind of thing I would expect them to do in the HSE. Like they wouldn't expect you necessarily don't quote me on this, but they wouldn't necessarily expect you to know what like a baryon is because it's not specified in the syllabus. Um, instead, they'll just give you the context there and they expect you to understand sort of what is a quark, what is an anti-quark, like how do those things work together. Um, so the standard model starts states that uh, baryons such as protons and neutrons consist of three quarks. And using the table, we need to figure out which of the following represents the quark composition for a neutron and an anti-neutron respectively. Now, hopefully you all remember the composition for a neutron, but if not, don't worry. All we need to know is that a neutron is neutrally charged, right? It has a net charge of zero. And if it's made up of ordinary quarks, right, the way we can get a net charge of zero is by doing one up quark and then two down quarks, right? That total charge is going to be two on three minus two times one on three which is equal to zero so our composition for a neutron is going to be up down down and then in order to find an anti-neutron well the anti-neutron is just the same as the neutron it's just made up of anti-particles so it's going to be all of the an respective anti-particles right so it's going to be the anti up oh, and then two anti-down quarks now because we're looking for the neutron and the anti-neutron respectively we our first option should be the up down down and the second option should be the anti up anti down anti down and so our answer is going to be c which is very nice because that is what our speed runner whoever it was <laughs> um, managed to get that question in just as i was changing the question there which i'm very impressed by very very nice work sorry i'm just uh getting a little bit thirsty okay with all of that said, let's jump in to actually doing a little bit of practice that took slightly longer than I had expected it to, but I just wanted to go over all of those concepts there because I know that they're the kinds of things that I often get questions about towards towards the end of the course, so I wanted to go through them all very, very quickly. But now let's zero in on some question types. So we're going to spend the next little bit uh, taking a look at calculations, and through this we're also going to look at some more difficult concepts as well, and then we'll have a break. And then we'll take a look at um, some extended responses as the last thing we take a look at. So quickly, let's take a uh, just talk quickly about some of the formulae that aren't on your sheet. Um, so your formula sheet has a lot of formulae for you to use. However, you don't necessarily need to remember all of the formulas that aren't on your formula sheet. Um, just as far as formulas that are not on your formula sheet, there are a handful that are specified in the syllabus, stuff like your escape velocity, your total orbital velocity, sorry, your, to your orbital velocity and to total orbital energy, um, and stuff like design speed on banked tracks. Instead, you should try and be able to derive all of these, right? 
Now, if you have never, um, or if you've come to this point and you've never derived these formulae, I would really encourage you to go through and have a crack at deriving them all at some point. Can't remember quite if I put them in the slides. We may have a go at this, um, but just in general, I would say rather than just memorizing what the formulae are, understand how you can derive them instead. Um, just quickly though, there is one formula that you do need to know that is not on the formula sheet and you can't really derive, but it's lovely and easy. It's just your frictional force is equal to the coefficient of friction times the null force. That's just something that I guess you should know, and I don't know why I wrote the double F there. Okay, lovely. Let's just quickly talk about how to approach your calculation questions. Now, this is something that hopefully you've been doing since all of the way back in year 11, but the first thing that you should always do is write down all of the variables and all of the values that you are given, right? Because you're probably going to be given a ton of information in the question, and so it's kind of your, your job is to work through and dig through all of the information that you've been given to figure out like what's actually going to be useful in these questions. Number two is drawing a diagram. This is so 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 important in especially advanced mechanics questions that are really really hard because drawing a diagram will help you to sort of wrap your head around like what's actually going on what forces are pointing in which direction like how do they interact with each other and it will really help you to understand like okay like what are we actually doing here um Finally, if you can figure out what the variable is that you're trying to find, you can kind of work backwards and be like, okay, I need to figure out what this number is. And in order to find that, I need to find these values. And in order to find those values, I need these values. And oh, look, I have these values. So therefore I can find these values. And therefore I can find those values that I started with in the first place. It just allows you to be able to like kind of figure out the ladder of calculation in reverse. Then you need to figure out what are the equations that connect all of those variables will like we have to jump through kind of different equations in order to get from one point to the other. And then finally, and this is something that please, please, please always do, have a think about your final answer, right? Like if you've got a satellite that is traveling at a thousand kilometers per hour, um, I don't know if that's, <laughs> let's think is a thousand kilometers per hour, yeah. So if you've got something that's traveling at like a ridiculously high speed and then you're asked to calculate its kinetic energy and you get a kinetic energy of like three, think like does that make sense does it actually make sense that my thing is moving ridiculously fast and has a stupidly slow uh has a stupidly slow kinetic energy right think if you're asked to calculate like how fast the car is going and you get like an answer of four times the speed of light does that sound correct <laughs> um so yeah just always whenever you're giving your final answer just do a bit of a sanity check do a bit of a mental check does this number seem reasonable is this number actually something that makes sense um so is the sign correct like does the magnitude seem way out of whack with all of your other values or is it around about the same idea now let's actually get into some practice now as always these questions are a little bit meatier and some of these are questions that you might feel a lot more comfortable with other questions or questions that you might look at and you're just like ah oh, yuck um so we're going to go through these starting off kind of i'm going to go through vaguely try and go through calculation questions from most of the different topics um and they're all going to be slightly spicier questions um so with all of them i would really encourage you if you feel comfortable have a go at them <laughs> sorry just joking <laughs> okay <laughs> Oh, it's too excited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys, you can have a go at this question. I'm just going to die, die briefly. <laughs> just, just bear with me. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I was just too fired up for freaking Maverick's F-18 plane. <laughs> okay. <gasps> What can I say? Physics is wild, guys. Okay, so Maverick's F-18 plane is flying at a constant altitude of 200 meters and a speed of 300 meters per second when he fires a missile. The missile's rockets accelerate at 25 meters per second for 10 seconds in a straight line until the fuel runs out. At this point, the missiles follow normal projectile motion and cruise down to the surface. We need to determine the distance from a target that Maverick should fire the missile in order to hit it. So what I was saying before I started dying um, <laughs> was basically, if you want to have a crack at this question by yourself, feel free. Um, I might have to start. I'm, I'm just going to calm myself down for a second because, uh, yeah, I don't want to die in the middle of, of, of an Aetano selection. That would be not great. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you want to have a go at the question by yourself, feel free. 
otherwise, feel free to work along uh, alongside it with me. And if you get to the point where you're like, oh yeah, I can do the rest of the question by myself, feel free to go off ahead without me. Anyway, we need to figure out how far the from the target Maverick should fire the missile in order to hit it. Um, so in order to do this, let's draw a little bit of a diagram because like we've got all the numbers there, but I guess maybe we might skip the first step. We'll come back to the first step later. But the first thing we might do here is actually draw a diagram of what is going on, right? So we can vaguely split the motion into two components. First of all, we've got the rockets accelerating at this speed for 10 seconds until the fuel runs out. So we've sort of got the rockets rockets go nyum. Um, if we launch, if we fire the targets here, the rockets go nyum, 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 up to this point after 10 seconds. And then after this point here, the rockets fall down and just do that chill projectile motion um, after that point there. Now, um, we are also told that this is a distance 200 meters above the surface. So we could maybe jot that down as well. We're firing at 200 meters above the ground. And Based off that, we can kind of see we can split the time into two components, right? We've got this kind of first point here, and we've got this last point over here. Now, um, for both, the, both parts of the motion, we are interested in what is the actual horizontal displacement that we are undergoing during this section of the motion. Um, so that's what we want to calculate for both of them. However, we are also going to need to figure out some of the stuff that's going on at this point here so we can actually do our normal projectile motion calculations then. So, first of all, I guess let's analyze this first 10 seconds of motion. And the two things that we're going to be interested in, first of all, we're going to be interested in well, what is our final velocity, like how fast are we going when we hit this point over here. And once we figured that out, we can figure out, okay, well, how far did it actually travel there? So let's call it, um, let's call it our V initial, or like the V that we're actually interested in is our velocity here. So, um, if we write out some of the information, we are trying to find our velocity. That's what we're interested in, right? We are told in this first section of the motion, and just to sort of clarify, I am only focused on this first section of the motion so far. We can ignore whatever's happening over here. We're just interested in section one. So we can say at this point here, our acceleration is 25 meters per second squared. Um, and our initial velocity, we're told, is a speed of 300 meters per second. We also know that this happens for 10 seconds, so we've got our t is equal to 10, um, and we, we want to figure out our s as well. So, first of all, we can figure out, I don't know, maybe we can go with s first, and if we look at all of the numbers that we know, the equation that will be helpful here is going to be our s equals ut plus half at squared, right? This is basically just a glorified projectile motion question. And in order to do our projectile motion, we want to use our SUVAT equation. So U is equal to 300 times by our time, which is 10 seconds, plus half times our 25 meters per second, which is our acceleration, times 10 squared. Okay, 300 times 10 plus half times 25 times n squared, which gives us a value of 4,250 meters. Basically, going back up to this point, we can relabel this as 400 to 4,250 meters. That is how far um, the projectile is traveling in this time here. The other thing we need to figure out is how fast is it traveling when it gets to this point over here. And if we sort of flick away from our distance. I mean, now that we know what our displacement is, we could use that to calculate it as well. But I think probably the easiest formula to use is going to be our velocity is equal to u plus a t. Our u is 300, our acceleration is 25, and we're doing it for 10 seconds, which gives us a initial velocity now for the second part of the motion of 300 plus 25 times 10, which is 550 meters. Okay, so let's kind of jot that down, right? I might call it S1. Our S1 that we're interested in is 4,250. Um, and we know that our new initial velocity, which is the initial velocity we're traveling at at this point here, is 550 meters. That is how fast we're traveling when we hit this point here. Now, um, I'm just going to flick over to the next slide, so I've got a bit more space. I will leave this up here, though. Um, but we can say, sorry, that was, so our S was, whatever it was, 4,250, and then our U in the X direction now, because we are going to be dealing with projectile motion, is equal to 5,550. So, speaking of projectile motion, let's just quickly redraw our diagram. What is happening here? Well, we are moving horizontally at 550 meters, and then our projectile 
falls out like this, a total distance of 200 meters. Um, if we write out some of our other numbers, I guess we can split it into the X component and the Y component is generally a pretty good uh, par for the course. Now, we are interested in, we know that our acceleration in the X direction is zero. We are interested in figuring out what is our displacement in the X direction. That's what we're trying to find. And we don't know how long it is. So remember, your time is the glue that sort of sticks your X components and your Y components together, which means we probably want to take a look at what's going on in the Y direction, and that will tell us um, what is happening here. So in our Y direction, we have our classic acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second. We also know that our displacement is something to do with 200. Now just pausing quickly for a second, if we take our initial position to be this point here, well, once we've fallen 200 meters, our final displacement is going to be negative 200 because we've fallen down 200. Um, either way, if you wanted to hypothetically just call downwards as positive, that would then, like, let's say you take a look at all these negatives and you're like, that's kind of gross. Um, alternatively, you just could call that the positive to, sorry, the downwards direction to be positive, in which case these two values would be positive. It's really up to you whichever way you want to do the question. Um, aside from that, we know that initially the, the missile is moving horizontally, so our initial velocity in the y direction is equal to zero, right? We're told that in the question, and we can assume that it doesn't really change direction. And then finally, our time is an unknown, that's what we're interested in, and because that's the glue that holds the two parts together, that's probably what we're interested in. So looking at all of these values here, the formula we probably want to use is our s equals ut plus half a t squared, our u is equal to zero, so this term just disappears, which gives us negative 200 is equal to half times negative 9.8 times t squared, rearrange for t, you are going to get uh, negative 200 times 2 divided by negative 9.8 is equal to t squared, so we can square root both sides. Chuck that onto your calculator. I mean, we can cancel that if you're like looking at the square root, the square root of the negatives and you're like, ah, oh, what's going on? Don't worry, we can just cancel those negatives out. So that gives us 200 times two divided by 9.8, all square rooted, which gives us a time of 6.389 uh, seconds there. Now, if we do our quick mental sanity check, okay, six seconds for falling sounds decently high, but also like we are falling 200 meters. So like, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable enough number. Um, and also, side note, like, I know I didn't do it for these two numbers, but we were accelerating very quickly for quite a long period of time, so these numbers, like, just as a sanity check, yes, they seem relatively reasonable. Um, okay, so our time is 6.389 seconds, um, and so chucking all of our numbers then into our calculus, sorry, chucking our numbers into our formula, we want to figure out what the displacement in the x direction was for this component here, so we can say the displacement in the x direction, well, Using your u, your s equals ut plus half at squared, because a is zero, that just drops out. I'm sure you're all projectile motion masters by this point. You know this. Um, so it's going to be the initial velocity in the x direction times time. Um, our initial velocity in the x direction was 550 times 6.389 seconds, which gives us a displacement of um, 3,513.8 meters. And so our total displacement, which essentially remember what we were looking for was how far away from the target we needed to fire the missile, is going to be the sum of these two. So add them together, 4,250, which gives us 7763.82, right? That's equal to, sorry, 4250 plus that 3513.8. Okay. Um, lovely, lots of lovely answers there. That is very, very nice to see. Okay, really, really great job there, guys. Um, I'm very happy with those answers here, and it seems like I have recovered from almost not dying. I promise I'm not going to die on you guys uh, in these questions here. Now, um, this is a question on distinguishing between escape velocity and orbital velocity. Um, I think hopefully at this point you can, uh, you hopefully have seen this kind of thing before. If you really want me to go through and derive the orbital and escape velocity, chuck a question in the Q&A and I'm happy to do it. But just in the interest of time, let's have a go at this question instead. So I'm gonna skip this one. Um, if you want to have a go at doing the orbital velocity and escape velocities by yourself, feel free. However, this is a much trickier question and a much, I guess, a slightly funkier question. Um, and so I want to have a go at doing this one because I think it's going to be more valuable for your time. So, 
A car with a mass of 1,280 kilograms travels around a bend with a radius of 12 meters. The total sideways friction on the car's wheels is 16,400 newtons. Calculate the maximum constant speed at which the car can be driven around the bend without skidding off the road if the road is banked at an angle of 10 degrees. Okay. What we are doing here is we are doing some kind of banked curves question, which is why I said that we, we're going to do this one. We're going to kind of skip the, the orbital velocity because I know even though orbital velocity and stuff like that is kind of funky, more people hate banked curves. And so I wanted to have a look at one of these questions because I know that they are very, very gross. Now, this kind of question is where drawing your diagram is going to become really, really super useful because it's going to allow you to construct equations that allow you to sort of describe the motion. Because a lot of the problem with, like, a lot of the difficult thinking in this question is just about trying to find those equations, trying to figure out, like, what are the equations that we can use to describe the motion in this situation? And I promise you, once we've actually found the equations, it's, it's fairly straightforward to solve them. Um, the tricky thing is actually just finding those equations in the first place. So, Let's have a go at trying to figure this one out. So a car is traveling around a bend with a radius of 12 meters. The total sideway friction on the car's wheel is uh, that number there. Now, in order to figure out the maximum speed, we're going to need to figure out the maximum centripetal force that we can travel our car at. Um, and in order to do this, let's draw a quick diagram of actually what's going on in this situation. So we've got a banked curve. The bank curve is banked at 10 degrees. So this is very much not to scale. Don't like uh, this. This diagram is just to get us a bit of an understanding of what's going on. Um, and here is my incredibly scientific diagram of a car. All right. That bad boy is a freaking G wagon. OK, all my homies want that car there. It is just absolutely insane. So this is our diagram, but in order to actually use it, we need to think about like what's actually going on here. We need to draw a free body diagram. We need to include all of the forces that are being it, that are involved in this situation. Now, whenever we have motion on a banked curve, well, first of all, whenever we have a banked curve, there are always two forces. We always have at least our gravitational force. So this is our FG and we always have our normal force as well. This is our FN pointing up over there. Um, those two forces always rock up. Now, because we are told that we have centripetal force, right? We're, we're asking about what, like, what velocity can we travel around in a circle without, without our car slipping off. Um, our centripetal force always points up straight in towards the circ the center of our circle. So if our circ if we're moving in circular motion around like this, our centripetal force will point towards the center of the circle like that. However, we're not quite out of the woods yet in terms of forces. We still have one more force we have to consider, which is that in the question we are told the total sideways friction on the car's wheels is this number there. Basically, we also need to consider where our frictional force is going. Now, we have two potential options for where our frictional force is going to be pointing, right? Because our frictional force always opposes the direction of motion that we're looking for. Now, if we were to slip down the plane, the frictional force would point up the plane, whereas if we were to... Uh, be slipping up the plane, um, our frictional force would point down the plane. Now, moving at a maximum speed, i.e. if we're trying to travel as fast as we possibly can, we can assume that our uh, frictional force is going to be pointing down the plane to stop us from slipping up the plane, right? Because if we were traveling too fast, we would start sliding up the plane, we would sort of skid out of the road, and so as a result, our frictional force, we can assume, is pointing down like that. Now, just really quickly, I'm going to draw this slightly larger just because I think it's important to be able to see all of the forces individually. So here's our normal force. Here is our centripetal force. And I should reiterate that those two are perpendicular to each other. And here is our frictional force over here. Um, so what we're going to do now, now that we have drawn that diagram, the job is going to be actually using these to construct equations. Now, normally what you would do and what you might be comfortable doing, um, like most of the time is we take our gravitational force. I didn't actually label this as the gravitational force, but it is the gravitational force and we split it into two components, right? Most of the time we would split the gravitational force into like a horizontal component and a vertical component, or sorry, like a component that's parallel to the plane and a component that's not parallel to the plane. 
However, in this case, we're actually not going to do that. Instead, because we're interested in the centripetal force, and the centripetal force is a funky force that actually doesn't exist by itself, but instead is actually a force that comes about as a result of all of the other forces, what we're going to do is we're going to try and resolve our forces into the plane of the centripetal force. Basically, we're going to split up all of our forces, and I'm going to redraw my centripetal force, sorry, just because it wasn't quite horizontal. Um, we're going to redraw all of our vectors so that they have sort of components that are in the same direction as wherever our centripetal force is. Now, the... Uh, the plane of the centripetal force is the normal vertical and horizontal axis, right? It's pointing horizontally, 90 degrees to that is the vertical axis. So basically, we just want to figure out what are all of the components of the forces in these uh, horizontal and vertical axes. Now, one of the one other force, aside from the, from the centripetal force, and sorry, let me just reiterate that again. The reason we're doing this is because we're, what we're looking for is the centripetal force, right? We're trying to find the centripetal force, and so as a result, we're, we're sort of forcing everything to conform with the centripetal force, right? We like the centripetal force, that's what our, our baby is, all right? That's what we're trying to find. Um, and so as a result, that's what we're going to force everything to conform to. If you have a quick question, like, about, like, why, like, is it still okay to do things in terms of the normal and frictional force, i.e. the plane of, like, perpendicular to the plane and horizontal to the plane? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. It's just going to be slightly more complicated, which is why I've chosen to do re resolving um, into the, the plane of the centripetal force. Now, the two forces we're going to have to resolve are going to be our normal force, which will resolve like this, and then our frictional force, which are, I mean, it's kind of on top of the centripetal force, but we will resolve like that as well. Now, you can do quite a bit of complicated trigonometry, but once you've done the complicated trigonometry, you will basically be able to show that this angle here is also 10 degrees, and this angle down here is 10 degrees as well. The vague idea as to why that is, is because this is a right angle triangle, so this angle here is going to be 90 minus 10 degrees, and this is also a right angle triangle, so those two add together for 10 degrees, and also this is a right angle triangle, so these two add together, so that's going to be 10 degrees, so those two are vertically opposite. Um, don't stress too much you can just kind of remember that those that's like how the trigonometry works out um but what is it what is important is the fact that we have these triangles here now i'm going to quickly resolve the frictional force and then i'll leave the normal force for you guys to do or i i sort of won't explain it in too much detail but if this is our frictional force here and our frictional force is pointing down like that so we can split it into two components like this here's our 10 degrees and this is a right angle sort of like how we can resolve our initial velocity when we're dealing with projectile motion we can split the frictional force into horizontal and vertical components right um so the co sine of 10 degrees is equal to the op uh, adjacent side, which is this side I might label x, divided by the hypotenuse, which is our frictional force, which tells us that our x component is equal to the frictional force times by cos of 10, right? That's moving that thing across. So that tells us that this component here is the frictional force times cos of 10. And similarly, this side over here is the frictional force times sine of 10, because instead of using cos, we'll do sine of 10 is equal to y divided by the frictional force. So that tells us that this component here is the frictional force times sine of 10. Um, and I'm going to label that on over here. So we've now got this is our frictional force times sine of 10. And Oh, I might draw it with an arrow just to sort of indicate in over here we have frictional force times uh, cos of 10 as well. Now, similarly, for our normal force, right, our normal force, here's our normal force up here, and we've got, I guess, the x component and the y component. This is an angle of 10, so actually this is now the y component, this is the x component. This time our y component, this thing over here is going to be our normal force times cos of 10, and then the other side over here, it's really getting cramped. I literally drew it bigger so I would have more space. This force here is Fn times sine of 10. Okay. That was a lot. And now we have, but now we have sort of our completed vector diagram. I'm going to clean part of it up just because there are some unnecessary things that we don't need here. And hopefully that will make it slightly less confusing. Um, 
But the key thing is now that we've got all of our forces up there, we've got all of our forces resolved into the components that we're interested in, we found what all of those components are, we can, can start we can start constructing some actual equations, right? We can start considering, okay, what are all of the forces that are acting in every single direction and like how do they interact with each other? Now, the first thing we can consider is the vertical plane, right? Because our car, we can assume, isn't like flying off into the sky. It's just staying stationary on the plane. Well, not stationary, it's moving in circular motion. But like in terms of the vertical axis, it's not flying off. It's, it's staying on like connected to the plane. And that tells us that all of the forces that are acting in the vertical plane are balanced. Basically, the ones that are pointing down are exactly equal and opposite to the forces that are pointing up i.e. like the forces pointing down are equal to the forces pointing up. Now we only have one force that is pointing directly up and that is this normal force component here, our Fn times cos of 10. As far as forces pointing straight down though, the obvious one is our gravitational force. So we've got the gravitational force and we've got one other component of force which is pointing down, which was this component of the frictional force. Our Fr sine 10 is the component that is pointing straight down. So we've got the gravitational force plus the frictional force times sine of 10. Okay, just to recap that, recap that for a second, all right? What we're doing here is we're balancing our vertical forces. We're saying that our, like, our car is not doing any kind of like net motion in the vertical axis. It's not flying off into the sky. It's not sinking down into the plane. It's chilling in the vertical axis, which means that all of the forces pointing down have to be equal to all of the forces pointing up. Um, so in this case, our frictional force, we've got our normal force pointing up, we've got gravity and this component of the normal of the frictional force pointing down. Um, and so now we've constructed this equation. And if we start substituting some numbers in now, we actually don't know what our normal force is. So we'll leave that as F net, oh, sorry, leave that as Fn times cos 10 is equal to our gravitational force, which is mass times gravity. So that's going to be 1,280 times 9.8 plus our frictional force, which is given to us as 16,400 times sine of 10. So we can actually evaluate everything on this side. So that gives us one, two, and I might just quickly write out that's mass times gravity. If you were confused about that, um, 1280 times 9.8 plus 16400 times sine of 10, um, which gives you a total force on that direction of 15,391.8. And then because we don't know what the normal force is, we can divide that across by cos of 10. So we can say our normal force is 15,391.8 divided by cos of 10, which is equal to cos of 10 is equal to 15,629.27. Okay, just a quick sanity check, right? Does that number sound reasonable? Well, yes, okay, so our mass is pretty high and also the normal force in this case would be less than just straight mass times acceleration. Um, so you would expect it to be slightly less or like around about that number. Okay, yeah, it's, it's kind of what we would expect to get in this case here. Um, all right, so now we've done all of that resolution there. It's time to consider what is going on in our horizontal direction. So our vertical direction has allowed us to evaluate what is our normal force uh, equal to. Now let's consider what are all the forces doing in the horizontal direction. Now we have three forces in the horizontal direction. We've got our Fn sine theta. So that's our Fn. I'm going to redraw them just because our diagram is very messy. So Fn sine 10. We've also got this component here of the frictional force, right? So that's our Fc cos of 10. And then lastly, we have our centripetal force, which is pointing over here. Now you might be kind of confused because you might be thinking, hang on, all of these forces are pointing in the same direction, right? Like over here, we were able to say that the forces pointing up were equal to the forces pointing down, so they cancelled each other out. But in this case here, all of our forces are pointing in the same direction. Like what's going on, right? How can we solve this? Well, in order to do that, we need to remember what is the centripetal force? Well, the centripetal force is not just a force that exists by itself, but it's actually a force that comes about because of the other forces in our system. Basically, our centripetal force should be equal to the sum of all of the other forces in our system. 
or in other words, we can say that our centripetal force is equal to these two when we add them together, right? Our centripetal force is equal to Fn sine of 10 plus F, uh, sorry, that should be F frictional down here, F frictional times cos of 10. Okay, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you guys. And now, remember, we know what our normal force is, we calculated it, we know what our frictional force is, that's our 16,400, so we can sub in our values and actually finally evaluate what our centripetal force is. So that gives us 15,629.27 times sine of 10, plus our frictional force, which is 16,400 times cos of 10 there. Okay. Um, if we chuck all of that into your calculator, sine of 10 plus 16,400 times cos of 10, we get a centripetal force. Our FC um, is equal to, and this is going to be sketch, is equal to 18,864.84. Now I'm going to quickly clear up some space up the top here because we're still not out of the woods yet. <laughs> this is quite a nasty question. I imagine maybe in an HSC it would be worth a couple more marks than just three marks. But now that we've figured out our centripetal force is equal to our uh, 18,864.84. Just quick sanity check, right? Does that sound reasonable? Well, our centripetal force is being like is composed of the sum of both the frictional force and the normal force. Our frictional force is pretty high. Our normal force was also pretty high. So yes, we would expect to have a decently high centripetal force. Now we can finally use the good old fashioned centripetal force formula, mv squared divided by r. Um, just as a heads up, the reason we couldn't use this from the start was because we didn't know what v was, right? We it, we couldn't solve what our centripetal force was if we didn't know what v was. We are trying to solve for v, so we can rearrange this equation to say v is going to be the square root of r times our centripetal force divided by the mass. And now we can sub in some numbers. So our radius is 12 meters, our mass is this huge number here, our centripetal force is what we calculated up at the top. So we get 12,000 and sorry, 1280 times 18,864, blah, 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 divided by our rate. Sorry. I watched that calculation up, it should be the radius up to 12, so let me just quickly rub some of that stuff out. I might get rid of this equation down here, so I've got a little bit more space. Um, and look, hey, sometimes, guys, these things happen. Um, okay, we then have our velocity is going to be the 12 meters times our centripetal force, which is 18,864.84, divided by our mass, which is 12,080, sorry, 1,280. You chuck all of that onto your calculator, you end up with a value of, um, end up with a value of uh, 13.2. Uh, three or sorry, 13.2987, which is approximately 13.3 meters per second. Huh. And we are done. <laughs> all that for a drop of blood. Okay, let's quickly recap what we did here. First of all, we drew the equations. I'm um, sorry, we drew a diagram. We resolved all of our forces to get them in the same plane. We then constructed our equations, and once we had constructed our equations, we solved for the centripetal force, and once we had solved for the centripetal force, we were able to solve for V specifically. Lovely. Okay, that is really great to see. It's crazy to see, uh, lovely to see that a couple of you guys managed to trudge your way through there with me as well, which is wonderful to see. Okay, now we are well overdue for a break. Just quickly though, um, I want to tell you about some of uh, the incredible things offered by Notes. So I know it's crunch time. If you're interested in getting some extra assistance from one-on-one -on -one private tutoring, check out um, in the, the info section down below. You can do uh, book in your info call um, if you're interested in getting some extra assistance there. But before we jump into our actual break, let's answer a couple of Q&A questions. I said uh, that like I would do this and actually answer some questions, and I promise at the end of the lecture I will do more questions and I will actually focus on it, but let's quickly speed through a couple of them. So what tips do you have for someone who's better at the math side of physics using equation stuff than the content side of physics? Okay. Um, a lot of it just comes down to practice, right? Like part of the 
I, I definitely agree with you. I'm someone who's much better at the math side of physics um, than the content side of physics. So I suppose part of it's going to be doing a lot of practice with the writing style of questions and practicing like actually doing extended response style questions, um, actually practicing doing them and like reading through example answers, comparing them to your own responses and saying, okay, what can I get from these responses to actually help me improve? Um, on that note though, I we will go through doing some of the extended response questions and some of those techniques because part of it is also just remembering like, even though you might have written style questions, a lot like the language of physics is mathematics. So I sort of have a couple of techniques and I might actually leave this question up until I've gone through the extended response stuff because I want to come back to it and I once I can refer back to the things I was talking about because I am going to talk to this a little bit when we're going through the extended responses and if you decide that I don't satisfactorily answer this question when I go through the extended responses you can ask another question um, to ask me to, to go through this question again but I'll come back to this in the next section. Um, how many papers should I be doing? This is very much sort of up to how many uh, exams you have and at what point. Um, so physics is basically, I think it's the second last day of, you get, uh, of the HSE. So chances are for most of you, it's going to be your very, very last paper, right? Um, so I would say at this point here, your focus should mostly be doing on the, mostly on the subjects that are coming up immediately and the subjects you're struggling with. So if you are really struggling with physics, try and focus on it a little bit more. But at the moment, um, I would say you probably try and aim for, to do one to two uh one to two a week, probably at the moment, until like your first couple of exams are done. Um, once your exams start to skim down, ideally you should try and up that a little bit. And once you, I mean, I don't want to make the assumption that you're going to get up to a point where you just have physics, but like once you sort of reach the end, you should be trying to do one to two per day. Um, I would say between now and the actual HSC, you've got just over a month. Um, so 37 days is what I said at the start. That's what, five weeks. Um, if you can try and get a minimum of an average of three done per week, I think that that would be really, really phenomenal. So over the next couple of weeks, try and get two done. Um, and then I guess as you get closer, try and up it to uh, a couple, maybe once you're, once you're down to only a couple of different exams, try and up it a little bit to maybe one a day. And then once you've just got physics, try and do one to two a day. However, I also acknowledge that a lot of people are going to be really burnt out by that point. So doing two papers a day is going to be pretty intimidating. Um, yeah, so as to how many you should be doing, minimum, make sure you're getting through at least one a week um, at the moment. If you can do more than that, that's like great. Um, but yes, just in general though, like that's only for physics. I don't, I'm not sure if you were necessarily asking about like how many papers you should be doing for your study as a whole. Um, on that note, it's going to be slightly more complex, but I would say vaguely, at least for my exam strategy when I was studying for the HSC, I tried to do three subjects a day where I would do like, um, like in this stage here, when you've got all of your subjects ahead of you, I would generally try and do like an English paper in the morning and then like a practice paper for two other subjects in the afternoon and so that sort of meant that I could cover all of my subjects sort of over a two-day period um I could get like most of them done and do a practice paper from all of them and that sort of meant that I could do like three or so a week um for each of the subjects okay I, will, I promise there aren't that many questions right so I will dedicate like the rest uh, like the last solid chunk of the lecture to actually going through Q&A um but you have been sitting here for quite a while so far and I do want you to actually get up and have a break so we're going to take a quick nine minute break I will be back at 2:45 is when we will continue and we'll take we'll jump straight into doing some of the extended responses um go outside go to the bathroom, have something to drink, have something to eat, just look away from your laptop or your iPad or whatever you're watching on, go touch some grass, get up, do some, some star jumps or something like that. I will see you um, at 2.45. See you then. Bye.
All right, all right, all right. Let's jump back into it. Hopefully you've all had a little bit of a break and uh, you've gone outside, or at least like you weren't just sitting on another tab on your laptop. I mean, come on guys, it's like, the whole thing is two and a half hours. I don't want you sitting on your laptops the whole time. I mean, we say that and then we're like, yeah, let's do like a three hour physics paper. That's that's just fine. <laughs> anyway, um, I hope you are feeling a little bit more refreshed and ready to go for the last 45 minutes of our lecture today. Um, quickly, before we just jump right back into content, I wanted to let you know about a couple of the other things that we offer here at ATAR Notes. Um, so if you didn't know, we have a whole bunch of uh, like topic tests, course notes. We have a whole bunch of those kinds of things um available and actually i might talk uh, anyway um and you can buy them all if you are interested however you might not be interested in getting absolutely all of them but you might be interested in getting more of one and you don't have to like collect them all in which case um ed unlimited is just the thing for you so basically it's an online platform where for a low monthly fee you can access all of the different resources that we offer here at atar notes um or instead because you know you're almost just about to finish your hsc um you can use a free 21 day free trial using my code tim hsc right um you only have a couple more days left before your physics exam so you can basically just like get it free for the rest of your hsc um you know like just do it okay <laughs> um it's a, a great opportunity basically you get access to all of the topic tests all of the stuff for all of your different uh, courses um i can personally really attest to the physics core uh physics topic tests um and also stuff like the chemistry topic tests and the extension 2 topic tests i remember when i was doing my hsc they were really really helpful to me so go ahead and sign up using code tim hsc um when you are signing up However, we um if you do actually want to physically buy the books as well, um you can go to the bookshop, go to shop.atarnotes.com, um and you can get fifteen percent off if you want to buy the physical book, physical books as well using code September fifteen or fifteen SEP. Um you can access all of those links down below. One of the sides I really should figure out which side it is wherever all the resources are down below. Well, with that out of the way, I do have a couple of questions on calculation stuff. If you're interested, go ahead and check them out in the slides. You can download them, remember, down the bottom there. Just as a quick refresher for anyone who might have joined halfway, um, this whole thing is being recorded. You're able to access the recording of the entire thing right back um, as soon as the lecture is finished. Um, and also, if you scroll down below, you can answer like Q&A and polls and uh, you can download the slides. But I promised that we would do some work looking at extended response style questions, and uh, here we are. Let's take a look at some of my techniques that I would recommend for answering your extended response questions. So, just a bit, as a bit of context before we jump straight into answering, uh, like looking at some extended response questions. First of all, like what are extended response questions? Well, your HSC, uh, like your HSC exam, will contain at least two questions where just a single question is going to be worth between seven and nine marks. Not like as in like a question is like nine marks and then there's three subsections it's like the entire it's just one question that's worth nine marks so there's going to be at least two of them and realistically like they have to have a particular number of questions in the exam so it's probably really only going to be two of them that are worth between seven and nine marks and so that's what we're talking about here now the big part that like probably the hardest part about big questions is that there's often just so much that like you might feel like you might want to cover and so a big like challenge when you're faced with these questions is figuring out like what should I actually include what should I write down how can I make my question stand out and my first massive massive tip is just make a plan before you jump into answering your question make a plan about how you're going to answer the question treat it and I don't want to say the disgusting E word, but treat it vaguely like you would an English essay, right? Like hopefully in your English essays, you're not just straight away diving in. When you're confronted with the essay question, you take a minute, you take a second, you pause and you figure out, okay, what am I actually going to do to answer this question? Similarly, when you're answering an extended response question in physics, take a moment, read through the question a couple of times and figure out, okay, like what am I actually going to write about in this question? There's sort of two reasons as to why this is such a massive massive deal first of all it means you can think about the question and you're not just sort of you're not doing as much thinking about the question on the fly because so often and 
Um, so a lot, a lot of the time, I know students, and I know I do this as well sometimes, um, you read a question, you're like, okay, let's get going. But then like midway through the question, that's when you, like midway through while you're writing your solution, that's when you like actually figure out what you're supposed to be saying. And that's when you actually realize, oh, like, okay, that's maybe what I should have said in my answer. Um, but you're already like half, you're, you've already committed. And so that then means that your answer ends up being like half waffle. And then like, you've got a little tiny bit of gold at the end. So part of making the plan means that you can actually do that active thinking without wasting space and without wasting time in your answer. The other thing is it means that it gives you a chance to sort of organize your answer. So you're not just jumping straight into it and just vomiting your thoughts down on the page. Instead, um, you're just taking a little bit of a moment to just think through, okay, how can I construct my answer to this question? In what order? Like, how can I make it flow logically? How can I make one thing link into another thing? Because that is actually huge when you're answering these really, really long questions, making sure that all of the ideas in your question are, are like connecting logically up to one another. Um, so yeah, some other things that you can do as part of your plan, and this is what we're going to practice today, um, is you can break the question in down down into sub questions, right? So I said beforehand that like when I meant a nine mark question, I meant a, like a big nine mark question where the whole thing was nine marks and it wasn't nine marks and there was a whole bunch of sub questions. But what you can do is you can read that question and you can say, okay, if hypothetically this question actually was made up of a whole bunch of subsections, well, what would those subsections look like? Because I personally find it so much easier to, rather than just answer one really, really massive question, answer a whole bunch of much smaller questions. And I find that that's just much more palatable because like, you're just answering a whole bunch of little questions rather than answering one really big question. And lastly, it also means that you can feel confident that you covered everything you want to say. It means that if you have like a thought midway, um, like you, you don't have to worry about like being at the end of your response and feeling like you have to tack stuff on. It gives you a chance to sort of think through, okay, what is all of the stuff that I actually want to include when I am writing my response here? Um, and lastly, it gives your response some structure, which is really great and will basically guarantee you some marks just for having a good logical structure in your questions. So how do you go about planning your response? So here are some of the things that you can include and some of the strategies that you can employ when you are planning out your extended response. First of all, have some kind of introduction. Um, this is massive because so many people just jump straight into like answering the question, but like you've got nine marks. Chances are there's a lot of stuff that you're going to be discussing in your answer. So why not take a sentence just to sort of contextualize what you're going to say and just briefly run through like some of the thoughts, some of the things that you might mention here. This isn't like an, S an intro, like in English where it's like five marks, you've got your like thesis, you've got like, you've got to say the text title and name and stuff like that. It's not like that. It's more so you're going to use one sentence to sort of say, okay, here's what I'm going to chat about really quickly. Here's like why it's important. Um, this isn't super necessary, but I can tell you that so many students who do really well do include this just because it means their response and makes it so much like it structures their, their response really, really well. Um, another thing you can do, and you can do this sort of as part of the introduction, is just make sure that if there are key words and key terms and key concepts that you're going to be using, both concepts that have been mentioned in the question and concepts that you've got in your response, um, if you define all those responses, you show the marker that, yes, I actually understand what I'm talking about. Like, I know what I'm dealing with um, because this is what I'm dealing with here. Okay, now, one of my, like, best I guess the things that I found the most useful is this technique here, which is breaking the question down into different subsections, right? Because I know one of my, the reasons I hated English so much was just like the thought of having to write a continuous answer for 20 marks is just so terrifying. But if you then take your question and you split it up into like parts A, B, C, and D, um, and you imagine each of those subsections is maybe worth three marks, well, you're not writing an extended response together anymore. You're just basically writing three short answer questions with like connecting words between them to sort of join them together into a nice little neat thing. And this is what you can do as part of your preparation, right? You can break the question down into genuine chunks. And I promise you, one of the really great things about the new syllabus is most new syllabus questions are multifaceted, which makes them hard to answer because there's a lot of stuff going on. But it also means that there are kind of obvious sections, obvious chunks that you can break the response down into, which is actually really, really helpful. Um, 
And here is where I would say, like, and in answer to, I guess, the person who asked the question beforehand about, like, really struggling to answer an extended response, this is my personal secret sauce. What I call including physics elements, or I guess, like, gathering uh, evidence as well. Because I don't know about you, but I really hate, like, I really hated having to write um, any kind of essay or any just sort of long written response. And one way, really great way of making that more palatable was including stuff that wasn't necessarily just words. And these are the things that I call physical, physics elements, the things that sort of demonstrate that you have a really, really great understanding of physics, but also are just great because like, it's fun to not have to write a really long essay to instead have an essay to sort of, and then think, have things that are, are assisting it. Now, um, what these elements are, stuff like diagrams, graphs, equations, calculations, and experimental outlines. Now, the massive one is equations. Um, basically, if you've got a physics extended response, basically anything more than about five marks, so anything that's six to nine marks, and you don't have an equation in it, what are you doing? Okay, chances are, if you have an extended response, there is some sort of physics equation you can include. Um, and that right there, like you, you chuck the equation down, you explain like, why is the equation relevant? Like what are all the like components of the equation? Explain like what each symbol means, explain how we might use the equation, explain how it's relevant to the situation. Very nice, it like really adds to your response diagrams, right? So if you are talking about an experiment, draw what the experiment looked like. If you're talking about something like, I don't know, uh, projectile motion, you can draw like, what does projectile motion look like? If you're talking about circular motion, draw what circular motion looks like. If you're talking about, um, I don't know, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, draw a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Now, there's two reasons as to why this is so useful. Number one is because you can draw the diagram and it shows that you actually understand what you're talking about. But also, once you've drawn the diagram, you can refer back to it in your writing. So whenever you're described to like, when you, whenever you're asked to say describe a situation, it's often so much easier to draw the situation and just be like, this is the part of the situation I'm talking about, right? Like if you are asked to describe, say, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, if you draw a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, you can be like, oh yes. So we start off in the main sequence and then you label the main sequence in your diagram. So then like your marker knows, oh, okay, that's, that's the part that they're referring to as well. Um, if we're talking about the relationship between different like things in an experiment drawing a graph so for example your nuclear decay graphs um whether it be that whether it be like any kind of relationship from an equation or relationship in an experiment those kinds of graphs would be absolutely really really useful as well um experimental outlines this is particularly helpful in your module eight um whenever you're discussing sort of uh, the experiments that different uh, people would have done at different points in time. And then finally, calculations. Now, calculations, if you can include them, that's really, really great. Uh, they won't always necessarily be the, like something that you can always include because they will kind of depend on whether or not you've been given calc like numbers in the question to do calculations with. Um, it looks like in the new syllabus in your, in your exam, probably chances are your extended responses will have some kind of calculation element to them, which is really nice. Um, however, that's not necessarily guaranteed. That being said, there are some calculations that you can just do on the spot, right? You've got your whole data sheet. Um, if you can think outside the box, you can think about some calculations that you might be able to show, whether it be something like, you know, calculating the radius of a geostationary satellite, calculating the radius of something's uh, motion in uh, a uh, like magnetic field or something like that, or even doing, say, the like demonstrating the, the equations that like Millikan did in his experiment or the equations that Rutherford did in his experiment, stuff like that. So, my hot tips, my really, really hot tips here, make sure that you break the question down and make sure that you see and you think, are there any of these elements that I can include in my response that will just elevate it? Because, and my two reasons for doing this, number one is because if I include these elements, I don't have to write as much, but number two, they show, and sorry, three actually, number two, um, they show the marker that I actually understand really deeply what I'm talking about. I don't just have to write it. I, I, I'm not just writing the right, I'm just like, I'm also demonstrating that I understand this content quite deeply. And also, finally, um, it just really helps your response to be better because you can refer back to the diagram, you can refer back to your calculations, you can refer back to the equations as well. So, with all that being said, let's actually jump into some practice questions to see how we can put all of this into uh, motion. Now, we don't have enough time to actually go through and do a whole bunch of practice questions, but instead what we're going to do is um, 
Oops, sorry. I need to get to the actual questions. Um, okay, let's have a go at this. I hope that the poll is currently active. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to work through this question together. We're going to do this with a couple of questions, time willing. Um, we're basically going to imagine we're going to put all of this stuff into action, right? So let's read the question quickly. Compare the models of light that were proposed by Newton and proposed by Huygens and analyze the experimental evidence that supported the models at the time. Now, the question is seven marks and like, this is kind of a bit of a more like an essay style uh, question that we're dealing with here, right? Um, but we can still employ those same techniques that we had uh, previously. Most specifically, what we can do is we can really easily break the question down into easy, like much more manageable chunks, right? Because what we're doing is we're comparing the models of light between Newton and Huygens. And in order to do that, we're going to analyze the experimental evidence for each. So we can break it down in, I think we can break it down vaguely into four easy little chunks. First of all, what model of light was proposed by Newton, right? And let's like explore that explain what is the model of light that was proposed by uh, Newton, and then compare that with the model of light that was proposed by Huygens. Now, remember that this question did actually ask us to compare the two, and so while you're sort of describing, I guess, whichever one you do second, it's important to sort of refer back to the first one, right? So you could say, okay, Newton's model of light was the corpuscular model of light, whereas Huygens dis uh, used a, a wave model of light by contrast. Okay. Um, then, once we've described the model of light and we've done a little bit of a comparison between the two, we do the same thing just with the experimental evidence instead, right? So we consider what were the pieces of evidence that supported the wave model, what were the pieces of evidence that supported the corpuscular model? And then, the other thing we can think about, right, is what are the physics elements that we can include here, right? Because um, Huygens' model was very specific in the sense that it followed this idea of the Huygens principle, which was that every point on a waveform propag propagates other new fresh waveforms. And so when we're trying to describe Huygens' model of light, well, rather than just trying to describe like, oh, okay, Huygens' model of light was like an idea that, oh, okay, it's a, a wavefront where every point on the wavefront uh, generates new wavefronts. Let's like actually draw a diagram of that. Like, let's say, okay, here's a whole bunch of wavefronts, and then that collective wavefront then generates some new wavefronts, and then that collective wavefront there generates some new wavefronts, and so on and so forth. Like, yes, I know that that, that diagram there is not the best diagram that I've ever drawn in my entire life, but it gets the point across, right? And hopefully it will like lessen the amount of writing that we actually have to do because we've drawn a diagram to demonstrate what we mean. And similarly, with the experimental evidence, okay, well, what happened for the wave model of light? Well, we could demonstrate like, okay, it's a, it was supported by like wave reflection. It was supported by diffraction. No, not diffraction. It was supported by stuff like refraction. Oh, why did it support refraction? Oh, okay, it was because of Snell's law. And you know, if you remember what Snell's law is, we could jot that down as like something that was included there. Um, okay, and then tick the experimental evidence that supported the corpuscular model of light. Well, there was stuff like here's uh, reflection was just a, a collision between the two points. He also had this idea of like splitting the, the light into all of the different colors. Oh, let's draw a quick little diagram of that beautiful prism. Here's the white light and then it splits into multiple colors and then it splits up into that beautiful rainbow. And that's more stuff that we can use that we can refer back to in the diagram that just like visually makes our answer look more interesting. Because if you imagine you're the marker and you look at one page and it's just a wall of text and then you look at the next page and someone's drawn like the pretty prism like split into light like who's gonna get like whose response do you think is going to be the much more interesting one to read so hopefully if, let's take a look i see only two people have uh worked through the poll here but there we go so we can see the which model of light was proposed by newton it was the corpuscular model which model of light was proposed by huygens it was the wave model very nice tick all the experimental evidence that supported the wave model of light okay obviously i'm very sorry i didn't fill in this problem here and then all of the experimental evidence that supported the corpuscular i'm very sorry i didn't fill out all of the evidence there but just to quickly go over which evidence would be here right the experimental evidence for the wave model of light that was stuff like our um the fact that waves, we could observe light are reflecting and refracting and then eventually diffracting and interfering with itself. Whereas the corpuscular model of light, that was stuff like reflecting and this uh, 
this kind of splitting into multiple different colors and stuff like that. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a bit more confidence as to like the processes by which we can, like, I guess the, the techniques I would say are and the methods that we can use to try and write some of these extended responses. Um, so let's put that into practice. Let's have a go at another one here. Let's try just practicing this technique of splitting the, the extended response into multiple sections and then thinking about like, what are the additional things that we can include in each of those sections to really elevate the, the quality of our response as well. So our next question that we are going to try is additional, the uh, module eight additional sample questions 16. So our question is analyze the way in which scientists use observations and mathematics ideas to improve scientific models. In your answer, refer to the work of, of scientists who have contributed to our understanding of the model of the atom. Okay, um, so we're kind of forced to uh, focus on the model of the atom, so I guess here's the way, one of the ways that we could split this question up, right, because it's asking us to uh, analyze, I guess, the observations and the mathematical ideas that like contributed to the progression of the model of the atom. So first of all, let's pick like three different models of the atom. And then for each of those models of the atom, let's think about the experiments that provided evidence for those. And then let's consider what the mathematical ideas were that came up with these experiments. So for example, one way of answering this question would be, okay, um, what are some of the models of the atom that we could consider? Probably the ones that I would go with would be the plum pudding model of the atom, Rutherford's model of the atom, and Bohr's model of the atom. They're kind of the big three that we look at, and so they're probably the ones that most people would be comfortable with. So we could go with the, the plum uh, pudding model, we could go with the Rutherford model, and we could go with the Bohr model of the atom. So now we just need to think, okay, what are the different experiments that provided evidence for these models? Okay, um, well, for the plum pudding model, we could have the cathode ray experiments, we could have Thomson's experiments, we could have Millikan's experiments. So probably the most interesting ones are going to be the cathode ray, sorry, actually the cathode rays aren't too, too crazy. Let's go with Thomson's experiments. Um, and then we've got Millikan's experiments. And then for Rutherford's model, obviously it's gonna be the gold foil experiment. Um, and then Bohr's model of the atom, we can probably go with our emission spectrum. Um, those, are, those are all of the experiments that we can look at here. So now we need to think, okay, what are some mathematical ideas that helped um, in both the experiments and in developing the models of the atom. Now, Thomson's experiment, you can literally go through and just do the mathematics, right? So if you don't remember, we might, if we have, how are we going for time? I wanna go through another couple of questions. So I might not go through all of the mathematics for Thomson's, but remember what he did was equate the uh, electric and magnetic field forces on the cathode ray, use that to solve for velocity, and then use the radius of the magnetic field to calculate the mass to charge ratio. Um, by equating the magnetic field and making it uh, a circular motion, um, measuring the radius of the circular motion and use that to calculate the charge to mass ratio. Um, Millikan's oil drop experiment, once again, that's some equations like we have all of the equations that we need to be able to explore the mathematics of Millikan's oil drop experiment, right? So that's your uh, Fe is equal to Fg, where your Fe is equal to like Qv divided by D, and your M Mg, like you know what the mass is, so you can use that to calculate Q, um, et cetera, et cetera, and then finding the lowest common denominator of all of them. The gold foil experiment doesn't really have much like direct mathematics that we've looked at here, but at least with Bohr's model, we've also got the Rydberg equation, right? So that's your one on R, so one on lambda is equal to R, one on Nf squared minus Ni squared squared. And also then you've got de Broglie's contributions, right? De Broglie's ideas. So that's stuff like your lambda is h on mv. Um, and even if you wanted to go really, really deep, you could go with the idea of like, oh, okay, the standing waves are n, like the nth um, electron orbital is corresponding to n number of electron wavelengths in its circumference, i.e. our n lambda is equal to 2 pi r. Um, so hopefully what that has shown you is like, we have a lot of stuff we can talk about. Um, and now that we've done this brainstorming really quickly, all that's going to, to like, all we have to do is really just put it in a decent order, right? So start off with the plum pudding model, um, discuss the experiments, 
I would probably go with the order of do the ex like discuss the experiments as part of the experiments discuss the mathematics, then discuss how the experiments led to the plum pudding model, then go from there to Millikan's experiment, explain the mathematics, explain how that contributed to the plum pudding model, then from the plum pudding model go to the gold foil experiment, how that contributed up to Rutherford's model, then from here go to the emission spectrum, go from that to uh, this step here, then go back to Bohr's model, and then maybe go down to De Broglie's contribution and go to like the updated De Broglie. Uh, the updated Bohr's model. And how many marks was this question? This mark, the question was only eight marks, so we probably don't have to go in that much detail, but at the very least, hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea as to the structure, um, as to how we could answer this question fairly quickly. And I know I did spend quite a while, but I, that's only been like, I don't know, four minutes of brainstorming, which probably a little bit more than maybe you want to do in the actual exam, but at the very least in two minutes, if you speed, like did all this very quickly and I wasn't explaining to you what I was doing as I was doing, like this is not that far-fetched of a plan to come up with in one to two minutes. And we haven't even looked at like the last idea, which is can we think of a diagram from one of the experiments? So maybe that's what we could do for the gold foil experiment. Seeing as we didn't have any mathematics, we could draw a diagram for it instead and be able to refer back to, oh, okay, a lot, like it would be useful to be able to refer to the idea that, okay, some of them were deflected a little bit, and we can just demonstrate that by, I don't know, here's our gold foil, here's our detecting rate apparatus, and like, oh, look, most of them are on this side, but look, there's one that's over on the other side, and we can refer back to that in our diagram. Look, in the diagram, we show that, oh, most of them made it to the other side, and only a couple of them were deflected back over to the other side there. So hopefully that gives you a and once again, a bit of an idea as to like how we can break down the question, make a bit of a brainstorm. And these are the sorts of things that we can include, because like if you initially look at this question, this question looks like it's going to be a fat question focused on just like writing a whole bunch of stuff. But if we do it like this, like basically half of our question, like is dealing with the mathematics. So if you're someone who really likes dealing with, I guess, the mathematical side of physics, Here's kind of the cheat way that we can do it is we can we can focus on like exploring these experiments from the perspective of how we would do so mathematically. So let's see what your suggestions were. So we've got plum pudding from Thompson, we've got Rutherford and Bohr. Very nice. Seems to be most people are going with, with the same three. And that's what I would really recommend. Like they're the ones that we do in a whole lot of detail. So they're probably the ones we're most comfortable with. The gold foil, we've got the nucleus, um, lovely. And then we've got the oil drop experiment, the emission cathode, lovely cathode ray experiments, and just general cathode ray experiments. Lovely. Seems to be we're all on the same wavelength. Great minds think alike. And divergently as well. Um, okay, what are some mathematical ideas and equations that have helped in these experiments? The mass to charge ratio, very nice. The, the Rydberg equation, um, very cool. We've got all of our equations from uh, Millikan's oil drop experiment, all of those ones there. Rutherford, no maths, very nice. Rydberg equation and the quantization of angular momentum, very nice. We've got this one as well. Absolutely, we can. Um, and just a quick side note on using equations. Um, if there's an equation that you've encountered in general physics that we haven't necessarily gone through in like HSC, you are absolutely allowed to include those in your responses as well. If it's something that you've gone and researched and you've like, you feel like you have a pretty good understanding of what the equations actually are, feel free to chuck those in your extended responses as well. The danger with that is you do have to make sure you get the equation right. If you botch the equation in some way, shape or form, you're probably not going to get a ton of marks for that. But, um, you know, if you're really interested in like the quantum mechanics section and you've gone and learned the Schrodinger equation, feel free to drop the Schrodinger equation in there as well and be like, okay, this is how we describe the probability amplitudes of uh, our like probability cl cloud of probability in the Schrodinger model. Um, okay, now how are we going for time? We've got a, a I want to do want to spend a decent amount of chunk of time on Q&A. So what we might do is we'll do one more of these extended responses, um, extended response practices. And then I'll go through some, I'll try and speed run all of the Q&A there. But just a quick note on our ex new syllabus extended responses. So the new syllabus favors problem solving over rote memorization. Um, so basically what that means is you're much less likely to get an extended response that is just a straight essay. Instead, what you're probably going to have to do is either analyze a given situation using the physics ideas that you have, um, or basically just have to really deep dive into multiple parts of the syllabus at the same time, which is really nice if you're someone who, like, like if for our purposes, because it means that most of the questions are incredibly easy to split down into multiple chunks that make the questions so much easier to solve.
Um, so, for example, let's take a look at this question here from the 2019 HSE. So I forgot that this was a question. Um, draw a diagram. Yes, we can. Thank you to the person who included the smiley face. I'm glad that you are so supportive for uh, which, which diagrams we can draw. Let's have a go at this question here. So this question is fairly funky, and I'm not going to get too caught up into the specifics of actually answering the sections because they do act, it is actually quite a hard question, um, and we could be here for quite some time. Um, but the question essentially gives us a whole bunch of information then asks us to describe both the production and radiation of energy by the sun. And in our answer, we should include a quantitative analysis of both the power output and the surface temperature of the sun. Now, this question is really nice in the sense that it is incredibly easy to just chop up into bits, right? It's right there. It says describe both the production and radiation of energy from the sun, right? Question one. How does, like, describe the production of energy? Question two, describe the radiation of energy. Question three, and then it says in our answer include a quantitative analysis of both the power for output and surface temperature. Now, when it says quantitative analysis, you can interpret that as just calculations, right? That's what it means. So you can basically read this as four questions. Describe the production of radiation. Sorry, describe the production of energy by the sun. Describe the radiation of energy by the sun. Calculate the power output of the sun and calculate the surface temperature of the sun. Those are the four questions you can see. It's fairly straightforward um, to split the question up into. And both, like all of the segments are pretty meaty. So we could probably assign around about two marks to each of those questions there, which then brings us up to about eight marks. And so the last mark probably just comes from linking all those sections like closely together, having a little bit of an introduction at the start, and probably more importantly, just having one or two sentences at the end to wrap everything together. Um, Okay, so how does the sun produce energy? I'm curious, has anyone answered? Nah, that's fine. Um, but, because I don't, we're not gonna go through this in a ton of detail, because I do want to get onto Q and A. But vaguely you can say, okay, it's the proton-proton chain. Um, it's like mostly the proton-proton chain. It's a helium fusion. Um, sorry, no, it's hydrogen fusion. Maybe you can refer to stuff like your uh, mass defect and you can demonstrate like the mass defect experiment uh, or like the, the change in mass for something like a uh, helium nucleus, sorry, the proton-proton the chain um, and explain how like we actually produce mass through nuclear reactions. Then as to the how does the sun uh, radiate the, the energy, well, we've been given this graph in the curve, like we've been given this graph in the question. Um, so let's have a look at this. If you know your electromagnetic spectrum decently well, hopefully you'll recognize that these wavelengths here are visible light, um, which tells us that the radiation curve for the sun shows us that most of the radiation that we're getting from the sun is in the visible light spectrum. So how does it radiate energy? Well, it's mostly electromagnetic radiation, and the graph shows us that of the electromagnetic radiation, radiation, it's mostly visible light as well. Um, then we get onto the calculate sections, right? So calculate the sun's temperature and calculate the sun's power output. As for temperature, we've been given the, the Planck curve, so hopefully this is a kind of classic question you recognize. You look at your curve, you find your lambda max, you drop that down. Hopefully if you've got the paper in front of you, you can use like a ruler or something to figure out what the lambda max is. And then we can use Wien's law, right? Lambda max is equal to B on T to actually calculate what the temperature is. And then finally, we can calculate the sun's power output. Now, by this point, hopefully you will have figured out that like, oh, okay, we haven't used all of these numbers here. So we are going to use them in some way, shape or form to calculate the sun's power output. Now, this is where the question really gets hard. So I'm not going to actually go through this because it's going to take quite a while. If you are interested, take a look at the solutions in like, look up the 2019 HSC and take a look at the solutions. It's quite a complex question. question. It's quite an interesting question. But it's the kind of thing that I, the, the other reason I don't want to tell it to you right now is it's the kind of thing I would really encourage you to try and do by yourself um, without looking at the solutions, first of all. And then if you're struggling, try and look at the solutions afterwards, because it's a very interesting question in the sense that it's nothing like we haven't actually done this in the syllabus. And so instead, you just have to look at these numbers and try and use your experience as a physics student to try and figure out like based off these numbers and formulae, how can we calculate the power output? However, the important part and the thing that I wanted to focus on is we could literally just split this question up straight up, like literally just chopping it into chunks, right? Describe the production, describe the radiation, calculate the power output, calculate the surface temperature. Once we've chucked it into those chunks, like it, 
probably feels a lot nicer, right? Like calculate the surface temperature of the sun. That's something that hopefully all of us like are decently comfortable. Like once we've been given this radiation curve, are decently comfortable at being able to do. And then all you have to do is string those different sections together in some sort of logical structure. Okay. Let's just quickly see proton proton chain very nice uh visible radiation um we've got a couple of people mad lads who actually went through and calculated it and some people are going to try it later that is very nice now um i've been saying the whole time that i'll get on to q a so i am actually going to do that now um in the meantime though thank you so much to everyone who came um thank you to all of you for rocking up um go and I, i'm not going to go through any more content if you are interested in checking out the the rest of the stuff that i had on my slides make sure you download them and you can just go through them in your own time um but aside from that so thank you so much for coming go and smash your hsc you're almost there it's the final leg um then you get a, a whole bunch of freedom and it feels incredible um Go and smash it out. You're almost there. You got this. I will see you at some point later. But in the meantime, let's quickly do some Q&A. So how many papers? I feel like I answered this beforehand, but just, yep. Okay, so which tips do you have? So for someone who's better than at the math side of physics than the content side of physics, I suppose my techniques there will like try and incorporate the math side of physics into the content side of physics. So that's by using those like physics components to actually answer the questions and breaking them down into those longer responses. Aside from that, it's just gonna be a lot of practice. Okay which module is the most important um now in the hsc they generally tend to actually be pretty good sorry i was just thirsty um in the hsc they do actually seem to be pretty good at making it pretty evenly split so doing like 25 25 25 um per module or at the very least if it's not 25 25 25 it's sort of like uh, like 25, 24, 26. Um, so they are all pretty much exactly the same. As far as which one is the most important, it seems to be that a lot of the really tricky questions, I don't know, I, my, my immediate answer is that there's not necessarily one that's more important than any of the others, but I would say a lot of people tend to do worse in module six. <laughs> um, so if you can focus on that, like I do worse in module six. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you can do well in modules that most other people do bad in chances are your marks will get scaled up. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what, how should I approach the long response questions such as explaining the ultraviolet catastrophe? Hopefully some of the techniques that we went through were helpful there. Um, for the ultraviolet catastrophe, catastrophe specifically, you can do stuff like explain the historical context, draw some of like as far as like physics things that you can include, so you're not just always writing down questions. Draw it, you draw your graphs for the ultraviolet catastrophe. Draw like what the classical curve was, what the actual curve was. Um, then you can do stuff like uh, write out your E equals H F. Explain how Planck solved the ultraviolet catastrophe. Um, explain like your like Wien's law and how does Wien's law like how how does that sort of work into it stuff like that um I guess is how I would say you could approach that one specifically and the way that I just did that then like to approach the ultraviolet catastrophe was using those techniques I discussed beforehand about like breaking the question into parts and then looking at each of those parts individually um okay why didn't I apply it for the car program that's a good question and as so as to not cause me an existential crisis um most of it was honestly I wanted to do a double degree like I so I feel like the, the kind of scary thing about the co-op, so just a bit of context for anyone who doesn't know, um, UNSW and I think some of the other unis now um, offer this thing called the co-op program where an industry uh, company will basically sponsor your university degree. So it's really great for a couple of reasons. It means that as far as finding jobs and finding internships throughout your, your uh, degree, that's all covered. It means you get a really banger scholarship throughout the entirety of your degree. So you get a ton of money. So it's a really, really, really good thing for some people. Um, however, it does come with some side side effects like for example you are kind of locked into that like one degree um you can't like branch out very much it does also mean that you're locked into those internships right you can't just, like this isn't my experience because i don't have i don't do co-op but talking to people who do like it is sort of restrictive in the sense that you have to do your internship with that like company who sponsored you and you didn't necessarily get to choose who's sponsoring you so it is sort of like 
they have chosen you and if you don't like them then you either have to leave the co-op program or whatever that being said the opportunities are absolutely incredible as to why i didn't apply for it i was just sort of I reached to the point at the end of the HSE where I was like, I, I wasn't super confident in what I wanted to do. Um, and I didn't feel comfortable sort of going into that much of a restriction at that early of a point. So I would say that's why I didn't apply for it. I, yeah, <laughs> there's other reasons, but they're a bit more personal. Um, what would you say is the best way to get a deeper understanding for conceptual long response questions like magnetic breaking and De Broglie? Um, I suppose uh, there's two ways. My advice would be to play around a bit with the mathematics, like for example, for magnetic breaking, play around with the numbers and see what happens there. And for De Broglie, like get a, a deep understanding for what does like what does what are the mathematics of standing waves look like? Um, okay, uh, yeah. As a po uh, as a like beyond that though, a lot of it is just going to be. Um, I guess, making sure that you have a deep understanding of the ideas behind that, and then using those techniques behind that, of using those those same techniques of like, uh, break the question down, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. What are your answers to the poll questions? Um, hopefully most of the poll, oh, my answers to the original poll questions? Um, look, I'm doing, I, I don't remember exactly what the, the pre-lecture poll said, but uh, I'm definitely, I, I was vibing both the cheese and the sauce in the pizza thing, um, and I can't remember what the other questions were. Um, okay, can you explain, exp please explain magnetic breaking um, according to the hand rules? Okay, um, the big thing for magnetic breaking is use your right hand grip rule. So basically you can imagine your thumb is the direction of the magnetic field. You're going to get like sort of generate currents that are trying to oppose that direction of the magnetic field. So they're going to go in the opposite direction. Um, and those currents also generate like heat that strips energy away. Okay, why did you choose a double degree? Every smart tutor seems to be choosing to complete them. What are the pros and the cons? Okay, so the big pro obviously is that you get to do like two different degrees. So you get a much wider like scope of, I guess, if you have different interests, you can do both of those interests. Like for me, I was sort of like, I want to study maths because I really enjoy maths, but I wasn't necessarily sure. And I'm still not necessarily sure that that's the kind of thing I wanted to do as a job. Whereas engineering is the sort of thing that I was like, I really enjoy this. And also I can be employed as part of this. Um, so a lot of people either you have, to, there's, there's lots of different reasons for doing them. Um, some people it's like, they just want to study completely different things and that's the way that they can do it. Um, some people it's like, they just want to study a lot of different, like they, it satisfies all of their different interests that they have. Um, some people they're taking two different degrees because they complement each other really well. Like I think my degree combination complements each other really well. And I mean, most STEM combinations will complement each other really well and assist you to some extent um, in getting a job. The big con is that they just take a lot longer. So for example, my degree as like currently is, is set for six degrees. Do I think I'm going to do a full six degrees? Not necessarily, because I don't want to do high school 2.0 necessarily. Um, however, and yeah, so it's basically just more time. It takes a lot longer to complete. Whereas say, for example, if you were to do, I don't know, a single comp sci degree, you could be done in three years and immediately out into the workforce. So that's, it's sort of just a personal decision as to whether or not you want to do them. Um, Lots of people, even though you might just hear of lots of people doing double degrees, there are still lots of people who do single degrees as well. For a quick tangent, which is harder, Bachelor of Actuarial or Bachelor of Advanced Maths? Um, I, it really depends on what you're passionate about. I would personally say Bachelor of Actuarial, but that's because I hate statistics, so I could not imagine doing an entire degree based off actuarial. Um, Whereas because I really enjoy advanced maths, like, I mean, yes, the concepts are hard, but like, it's not that hard, <laughs> if that sort of makes sense. Um, if I had to make a vague, very sweeping judgment, I would say that <laughs> very few of the people I've met who would do actuary actually like seem to be enjoying their life. <laughs> so I would say based off that, actuary is maybe, is maybe more difficult. Um, and a lot of my friends who do actual have switched to advanced maths because they find that, no, they actually enjoy the maths, not the actual part. And there are jobs that you can get from just doing that. Um, okay, what's your HSE English mark? Uh, it was just, oh, okay, my English mark was 93. Um, so it was, it was good, <laughs> but like, it, I don't know, not great. Um, question one, can we, uh, okay, <laughs> can we play Minecraft after the HSC? Okay, I don't want to make any promises. Um, maybe. <laughs> How do you find the quantum engineering degree as it's a new one? Uh, 
Oh no, I've lost all of the questions. Okay, how do you find the quantum engineering degree as it's a new one? I think it's really great. It has a wonderful community. I mean, you have to be prepared. The thing that they don't tell you about it is that it's a subset of electrical engineering. So if you're not, if you're interested in the quantum side or the computational side, I would say maybe do rather than a quantum engineering, take something like comp sci with physics. Um, if you're interested in that sort of space. Um, but if you're interested, it, I, it's like, so quantum engineering is a, a lot of it, it's focused on quantum computing and there's sort of two different subsections to that. There's the hardware side and the software side. The degree at UNSW is very, like it involves a lot of software, but it is much more focused on the hardware side. So in order to get to the quantum level, you have to sort of make your way through a lot of electrical engineering, which I know a lot of people struggle with. Um, Okay, did I consider doing actuary? Um, I feel like most people who are interested in maths consider doing actuary at some point. Um, what turned me away was mostly I don't like statistics and it is a lot of statistics. It's also sort of, it's a very specific thing. And I think one of the beautiful things about maths is it's very open and it le leaves you with a lot of like, it leaves you with a lot of analysis skills and just sort of problem solving skills. Whereas actuarial studies also does that to a certain extent, but like, it sort of teaches you this very specific thing. I don't want to feel like I'm talking down on actuary. I have a lot of friends who are doing actuary and some of them seem to, uh, one of them seems to enjoy themselves. <laughs> um, but I think just on the point of actuary, I feel like when you're in high school, like you don't really get to see how many different possibilities there are in the workforce for STEM degrees. And when people are like, oh, are you interested in maths? It's kind of like, oh, you could study, you could become like a maths teacher or an actuary, or that's like it, right? But there, there are actually tons and tons and tons of jobs that involve mathematics. So if you're interested in maths, um, I would say take advanced maths with like something like computer science, because that will open up your opportunities like so, so, so much. Um, isn't the plan? I just want to go through. Isn't the planetary model Rutherford's model, which is before Bohr's? Yeah, the planetary Rutherford and nuclear model—they're all basically names for the same thing. Um, when I keep making mistakes and questions, I feel bad about myself. How do I keep improving on them uh, without feeling unmotivated? Just know that everyone makes mistakes, right? <laughs> the first question in today's lecture, I completely botched up, right? Everyone makes mistakes. We all get things wrong sometimes. Nobody is perfect. I am notorious for like just adding in random numbers or negatives or whatever in my questions here and there. So, um, it's a part of the learning process. And if you didn't make mistakes, then like you wouldn't have to do the exam in the first place because everything would be perfect. Um, why did I choose to do advanced maths in uni? I just really liked maths. Um, I think maths are like, mathematics are, I don't want to get too philosophical, but I'd say both like mathematics themselves are beautiful, but mathem learning mathematics is more so about learning a way of thinking um, as like just in as far as, Mathematics is, is more so just about learning how to think in a particular way and how to analyze different situations. Um, yeah, so that, that's part of, I suppose, why I did it um, and because I just enjoy it. Um, just to really speed through these questions, I joined the lecture a couple of minutes ago. Can I go back to the lecture after it's finished? Yep, it's all being recorded. Can we just dis uh, discuss how we f work out the direction of friction for banked curves? I got a bit confused. Um, Basically, because we were looking for the maximum speed, if we were going too fast, we would slip off the plane, like we would go start sliding off the plane. Whereas because we're trying to find the speed that will stop us to like not fall off the plane, the friction would be pointing downwards. Um, okay, just as I, I've been thinking about this one, um, look, hey, I don't want to super dox myself, but um, UNSW has a Minecraft society. It, the server is open to everyone and I don't want to say necessarily that I'm going to be on there, but you might see me around there sometimes. If you don't want, to, if you do want to hop on there, sometimes we are open to everyone. There are high school, high school students who are open there. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, what order do you recommend you complete the exam? I would say just do it in the order that the exam is given to you. Last question: Thoughts on trimesters, pros and cons. So this really depends. <laughs> my answer this to this question will very much depend on what time of the the trimester you're asking. Um, I think they aren't as bad as a lot of people make them out to be, but they are definitely bad in some ways. Um, the pros, the big pro is you're only taking a maximum of three subjects a term, which is really nice because it means you can focus on them. And sometimes you're only going to be taking two subjects a term, which is just so cool because like, which is just so good because it means you can focus on those subjects. Whereas at semesters, you're taking four subjects and that can be a lot to take care of at the same time. 
the con is that things move so quickly. Like if you if you are sick for like three days in a row, you're gonna be behind by like, <laughs> or at least it will feel like you're behind by like an entire week, um, which really really sucks. And sometimes it does feel like you just don't have enough time to properly learn some of the content. Um, the other pro is that because it sort of has inbuilt overloading, it does mean you will finish your degree faster um, if you decide to do that. But of course, you don't have to do it. And one of the cons is then then some people feel like because it's kind of built to assist in overloading, um, it uh, a lot of people get burnt out because of that. Um, I would say it's unfortunate, and I would not be disappointed if they decided to switch back to semester that I would support that change however it's it's not a deal breaker for me if that makes sense um and honestly now that I'm now that I'm kind of used to it I think I've been indoctrinated and I feel like it might I might struggle in semesters because I'm kind of used to the fast paced and like I guess relatively focusedness of trimesters I don't want to say that they're good but they're not terrible <laughs> is, is how I would describe them. Anyway, I, I might have to leave that there because I do know that they need these uh, ports for other lectures. But anyway, thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, I hope you all have a really great rest of the uh, rest of your time studying. Um, please do look after yourself and uh, like just enjoy the rest of like your time um, being a young adult. And hey, if you end up coming to some kind of engineering at UNSW, pop by, say hello. Um, I'm friendly. I might see you around. Anyway, have a really great time. I'll see you guys later. Um, look after yourselves. Go smash that exam. I know you've all got this. I'll see you later. Bye.